Thorn Ogres of Hagwood by Robin Jarvis, read by Geoffrey Palmer. Beneath the glimmering stars, the ancient sprawling forest of Hagwood was crowded with menace and black branching shadow. A solitary shape slipped swiftly, pausing only when it reached the edge of a steep bank and the chill air filled with the slow music of water. Here was the Hagburn, the stream that flowed close to the western border of that great tangled wood, and a pair of amber eyes glittered briefly as a proud head reared to gauge the distance. Springing forward, the creature leapt across the gulf and with a flick of her splendid tail alighted upon the far bank. For two days the vixen had patiently awaited her mate's return, but that afternoon, as she tended to their two young cubs and listened to their hungry yelps, she had finally acknowledged that she would never see the dog fox again. It was she who must now provide, and her own empty stomach snarled within her. Where the last shapely branches stretched out above an overgrown cinder track, she halted, ears erect. With trembling nostrils, she interrogated the drifting scents and caught the tantalizing fragrance of the remote, deep green water. Contemplating the fat, fleshy duck that would soon be hers, she shot from cover, drawing ever closer to the lonely mere. When the ground became soft and damp beneath her paws, the vixen slowed her pace and halted. Then, stealthily, she began to creep forward. The slightest of sounds caused her ears to flick, and she hesitated, glanced over her sleek shoulders. Something was close by, rustling through the grass behind her. A sudden awful fear seized her, and the desire to flee overwhelmed her. Summoning her strength, the vixen tensed, preparing to race back over the barren wilderness. Only then did she realise. The dark landscape of the heath changed. Tangled shapes, blacker than the encompassing night, had moved. The thorn bushes and knots of briar that she had so stealthily passed only minutes ago had shifted position, were now grouped together to form a dense thicket, barring her retreat. The vixen peered at that unnatural fence, confused and afraid. Who could have done this? Where in that expansive gloom was the mover of trees lurking? But within that prickly barrier was a narrow breach, just large enough for her to dart through. She flung herself forward. But before she could tear through that inviting gap, two pale points of light snapped open in the dim dark ahead, and a thin, rasping voice began to hiss with cruel laughter. At once, the heavy shadows all around glittered with countless luminous eyes, and a terrified yowl issued from the vixen's throat as there came a clattering of branches and the break in the hedge was no longer there. Unable to stop herself, the vixen went skidding and sliding right into the thicket's prickly heart. Across the empty heath and the flat surface of the mere, her pain-filled yelps went sailing as a score of bitter spikes needled into her flesh. Then the laughter began, crowing and cackling from every direction. All around her the dense hedge was moving, rearing from the stubbly grass upon many stumpy legs. They were the thorn ogres and from the swathing darkness misshapen limbs raked out, and high into the chill night air the vixen's dying scream soared. A golden dawn edged up over the rim of Hagwood, and the morning resounded with joyous birdsong. In the western corner of that vast woodland, the venerable oaks that grew between the Hagburn and the Cinder Track were home to many creatures, but none so strange as the forgotten race of the little whirling folk. How long they had dwelt there high in the trees no one knew, for they were accounted small and insignificant and had always been overlooked. But soon even the most high lady would be aware of them. This is their tale and it began upon that bright March morning in a snug chamber within the trunk of a great oak tree. Grunting softly in his sleep, Gamaliel Tumpin lay on his stomach, 
face buried in the soft, dry moss of the bed, in complete contentment, until his sister barged in. No, you don't, she gasped in outrage, and jumped heavily upon the mossy bed. Idle bones, she bawled. Don't you be late this first morning. I doesn't want you making a show of me. Father's bad enough. Jolted from sleep, Gamaliel was hauled from the bed. Canella Tumpin glowered down at her brother, stern disapproval etched into every freckled furrow of her forehead. How could you doze in today? she demanded. Gamaliel glared back at her. Canella was two years older than her brother and took every opportunity to boss and scold him. A plain, plump, whirling child with short reddish hair, she scrutinised the room and voiced her disdain. Messier than a rat hole in here. But Master Gibble won't stand for any of your sluggy tats and clatters. <laughs> I'll be shamed to be seen with you, she said, turning on her heel. And don't you go expecting me to sit next to you neither, for I won't. Well, that's something, I suppose. Have you? Canella was right. His room was a mess. The trouble was that Gamaliel could never bear to throw anything away, and his collection of colourful stones and pebbles had grown so large that they were now heaped all around the room, while his trove of shiny beetles' wings, seeds and knobbly twigs was beginning to spill out into the passageway. From the ceiling dangled an array of feathers, discovered on his scramblings among the uppermost branches of the oak that the Tumpin shared with two other whirling families. Gamaliel groaned inwardly. When would he have time to go searching for feathers now? In dejected silence, the young whirling hunted out his jerkin and breeches. Not as well padded as his sister, Gamaliel Tumpin was of the same plump stature. But whereas Canella was confident of her own skills, Gamaliel was not and he had been dreading this morning, certain that he would make a mess of things and do something idiotic. He had never been good at anything. Stop dawdling, his sister's voice yelled. He trudged despondently from the chamber. There you are, Tidubel Tumpin exclaimed, tapping the table that dominated the family's living space. Sit you down, have a bite to eat. Can't start all that learning if you're empty now, can you? Standing at her side, his whiskery face aglow with pride, her husband, Figgle, eyed his son affectionately. Tending Master Gibble's insta first time, he declared. How well I recall the day I started. How I... Figgle hurried to a corner of the room where a patent cloth concealed his wife's work basket. Canella eyed her father crossly. Is he never going to get rid of that? she demanded of her mother. I know he only keeps it to embarrass me. With his head ducked under the cloth, Figgle waggled his bottom from side to side, and the bushy red squirrel tail that stuck incongruously from the seat of his breeches and so scandalised his daughter gave a mischievous wave. Oh, mother, Canella objected. Everyone's laughing at him, and Master Gibble says father's making a mockery of his teaching. Nuts and pips, Figgle told his daughter. I can grow a tail if I want to. Kept me lovely and warm this winter it has. Returning to his wife's side, Figgle performed a little jig. Time for presenting, Figgle announced. Reaching into the basket, Mrs. Tumpin brought out a small black pouch fastened with two cords and with the utmost ceremony held it out to her son. Here, Gamaliel, she said tenderly, your special day has finally arrived. At last you will learn the secrets of shape and change the ancient knowledge that keeps our kind safe and hidden. Your very own Wurgle pouch. Made it myself out of the finest moleskin. Gamaliel looked up at his mother and saw the love in her face. That morning smile stayed with him till the end of his days. Thank you, he said, as he received a kiss upon the forehead. Wear it well, son, Figgle told him. Save your life, that will. I know mine has. I bet he loses it, Canella said sourly, and fingered her own wurgle pouch, which was hung about her neck. This was exactly the same as Gamaliel's, except that two red patches had been sewn on to show the level she had achieved in her training. 
Got a lot of hard work ahead if you're going to catch up with me, she boasted. And you'll never be as good as Finland. At that moment, there came the sound of a horn blowing, and Canella sprang to her feet. Gotta go, she cried, scurrying from the room. Well, Figgle murmured while his wife stuffed Gamaliel's pockets with food. Don't look so worried. Just do the best you can. Gamaliel gave a weak smile, then walked apprehensively down the passage that led to the outside. The moment he had hoped would never arrive was here. After the dim lantern light of the Tumpin home, the late March sunshine was dazzling, and when he gazed out across the leaf canopy, the young whirling set his thoughts free. In all his seven years, he had never been allowed to venture anywhere near the banks of the Hagburn, let alone the forest beyond, but in his dreams he had journeyed far into the dark heart of Hagwood. Now he sent his mind travelling out over the rolling landscape of the treetops, to where hushed tales told of gnarled yews that grew so close that not even a ray of light could slip between their tangled branches. Through that blind gloom he had often pressed, braving hideous perils until at last he arrived at the great green hill, that wonderful spectacle he never tired of gazing upon. Out over the green rustling sea that steadfast island reared in the hazy distance, and Gamaliel drank in the vision, as he had done countless times before, of the noble lords and ladies who dwell within its hallowed halls. There were many bewitching legends, and Gamaliel loved to hear them. Perhaps one day, he whispered to himself, one day I could go there and see it up close. At that moment, a fat squirrel barged straight into him. Hey! Gamaliel called as his feet slithered from the bark and he plummeted towards the ground until his instincts took control and his hands reached out to seize hold of a blurring branch. Immediately, the breakneck drop came to a stomach-jolting halt. Sweeping his legs high and over, he somersaulted and landed deftly upon the tree, out of breath and angry. The squirrel had been wearing his sister's cape and hood. Like all members of the whirling race, Gamaliel was an expert at climbing and scampered down the oak in a matter of moments. At the base of the tree, having returned to her own form, Canella was waiting, laughing. Not funny! Not funny! he shouted. Scooping up a handful of damp leaf mould, Gamaliel hurled it at her, but Canella leapt aside. She was about to pick up a quantity of the stuff herself when she stared over her brother's shoulder and thought better of it. You too? A gruff voice called impatiently. Stop larking about! Gamaliel turned sharply, and there, shambling towards the oak, was a large hedgehog. Morning, Mr. Mattock, Canella said, assuming an air of mock innocence. The prickly creature was a sorry-looking specimen. The bulky body sagged in the centre, and its movements were extremely peculiar. When it stumbled to a standstill, its middle drooped even more, and it sank strangely to the ground. Moving closer, Gamaliel peered at the blank holes where the eyes ought to have been and glimpsed a stern face staring out at him. Don't stand there gawping, lad. Do you want to be late on your first day? Get you in. As these words were spoken, the creature's entire head was thrown back and standing where its face had been was a grave-looking whirling. This was Yuri Mattock, a member of the presiding council, but today he, along with four other adults, was collecting those children about to commence their training and conveying them safely to the place of instruction. Don't gawk, boy, he snapped. There's an owl been seen these past few nights. What if it's late getting home and fancies a nibble of your daft head? <laughs> Death and danger all around. You should know that. Gamaliel stammered an apology, but his eyes were drawn to the two figures crouching behind Mr. Mattock inside the hedgehog skin. His heart sank. Mufus and Bufus Doolan were twins, the same age as Gamaliel. Practically identical with curly chestnut hair and upturned noses, they shared an irritating snigger and poked fun at everything and everybody. Hide and be safe! 
Mr. Mattock continued. Best disguise, this is. Until you're a bit older and have learnt a few tricks of your own. Now, lad, get a move on. Yes, Canella joined in. Stop dithering. Greatly flustered, Gamaliel hastened towards them. But the leaf mould was slippery, and before he knew what was happening, the young whirling was flying headfirst down the slope. Look out! Canella shrieked in horror. There was a thump and another, then a scuffle and squeals from the Doolan brothers, until, finally, Canella heard a horrible ripping sound. Oh, I never did! came Mr Mattock's indignant roar. Never in all my days! He was sprawled on the ground, his face covered in wet leaf mulch, hands thrust bizarrely through the hedgehog's empty ears. Nearby, Mufus and Bufus were hooting with laughter and pointing down the slope to where Gamaliel was still careering out of control, the back half of the now torn disguise wrapped tightly around him. Helpless with mirth, the Doolans gasped for breath. Don't, don't know about Gamaliel, Bufus wheezed. His name should be Gammy, 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 Mufus echoed in rapturous agreement. Wiping the dirt from his face, Yuri Mattock rose and glared at the ridiculous figure flailing on the ground. Get over here, you perfect fool, he raged. Canella had already fled, not wishing to have anything more to do with him. It was not the best of beginnings. But Gamaliel had the uncomfortable feeling that it was going to get a lot worse. At the foot of a lofty hazel tree, a decidedly ragged and peculiar-looking hedgehog came to rest, and four whirlings gladly cast the unconvincing deception aside. Looks like everyone else is here, Mr. Mattock informed them. We're late. The young whirling saw that four other prickly disguises had been abandoned and left until the end of the day when they would be needed again. You'd best climb up quick as a wink, Mr. Mattock advised. Master Gibble don't like to be kept waiting. The Doolans were soon swarming swiftly up the smooth bark of the hazel tree. Last one at the top is a gammy tumpin, they called out to one another. The hazel was of immense stature and amid the high branches a wide platform had been constructed. When Gamaliel Tumpin peered through the opening at its centre, he saw that he was indeed the last youngster to arrive. Sitting upon that wooden deck were more whirling children than he had ever seen assembled together before. Concentrating hard, he counted thirty-nine. Nervously, he glanced around to see if Master Gibble was present, and was enormously relieved to discover that he was not. Self-consciously, Gamaliel clambered onto the platform. Canella ignored him completely. Leaning forward, she grinned goofily at a youth several seats away. Who, Finnan? she called. I'll bet you've been practising all winter. Be taken over from Master Gibble one of these days, I reckon. The boy fidgeted uncomfortably. At the front, Gamaliel was trying to find a place to sit. Mufus Doolan budged up a little and shouted, Gummy, come sit with us. I dares you. N no, Gamaliel spluttered. I don't think... His words were drowned out by a sudden cry that screeched fiercely above their heads. Glancing upwards, the whirling children were horrified to see a great magpie come diving through the branches, talons outstretched. The youngsters fell on their faces, throwing their arms over their heads. We'll be eaten! they screamed. Save us! Save us! Only two remained where they were. Gamaliel was too thunderstruck to know what to do, and Finn and Lufkin, brushing the hair from his face, stared up at the ravaging bird. Dab crack, he murmured. The wily old boaster. Around him the older children were recovering from their initial shock. Then they began to coo with amazement. Hooray! they cheered. Isn't he clever? Aware that the disguise had at last been penetrated, the magpie gave a triumphant croak before alighting upon the platform. In a moment, the bird had vanished, and in its place was Tursa Gibble, the great grand Wurglemaster, the tutor of the Whirlings. He was tall and spindly, more like a twig than anything else. 
and taking his black gown from its hook, he wrapped it about himself and struck a pose. Gamaliel regarded his new teacher with awe. He had never witnessed such a dazzling display of his skill. Birds were an incredibly difficult shape to master. Basking in the adoration, the Wurgelmaster's mouth smiled serenely beneath the longest nose of any whirling. Resembling a blighted parsnip, over the years many extra nostrils had opened along its prodigious length, and at times of temper or high indignation his snorting breath would blast from those holes in sharp, whistling notes. The effect commanded much respect. When the applause subsided, the tutor's small black eyes fell upon Gamaliel. And you there, his pinched voice barked. What ails your knees? N nothing, sir. Then use them and sit down. Gamaliel, more nervous than ever, could only stare back at him. Mufus and Bufus started to titter. Not your name, the Wurgle master demanded. Speak now, speak. He's called Gammy, Bufus piped up. He's balmy. At the back of the assembly, Canella disowned Gamaliel completely and became suddenly fascinated by the branches above her head. Displeasure flared three of Master Gibble's nostrils, and a soft hiss emanated from them. Taking a menacing stride towards Gamaliel, he said, "'If the dote does not seat himself before I get to him, I shall snatch him up and hurl him over the edge.' Gamaliel felt his eyes begin to tingle. Master Gibble was almost upon him when a delicate hand reached up and tugged at Gamaliel's sleeve. Here, a kindly voice began, I've made a space. Sit next to me. Gamaliel plopped down on the deck with a bump. <laughs> Thank you, he managed to utter to the pretty whirling girl who had saved him. Master Gibble sneered. Now I see it. You're a tumpin, aren't you? Well, that explains a great deal. Your father has become a disgrace to all with that ludicrous tale of his. If I had my way, I should exile him, send him out over the Hagburn and let him fend for himself against the terrors of the great forest, to hide from the eyes and minds of our enemies. That is the sole purpose of our art. It is not to keep our toes warm. Canella promptly orphaned herself as well. The tutor turned from Gamaliel. If we debase our gift, then we debase ourselves, and only tragedy will follow. The children nodded their agreement, but Finn and Lufkin stared long at Master Gibble. Swinging his nose from side to side, the great Grand Wurgle Master appraised his new pupils and sniffed. It was time. Flinging his arms wide, he blew a short, shrill blast from his nostrils. The instruction commenced. The miraculous power of transformation, or whirling, to give it the proper name, was the whirlings to command. They had the ability to change their shape at will and become any creature of a similar size to themselves. Yet before this talent could be used, there were many rules to be learnt. Tersa Gibble was the latest in a distinguished line of respectable tutors and was the most important personage in the community. The first and most important lesson to learn, he began, is to know the ways of the beast whose shape you desire to assume. You must study the beast, run with it and know its habits. Only when you understand its spirit can you wear its external appearance. You shall spend the rest of the day pursuing and studying the creature that is the simplest to wurgle into. A mouse. I want each of you to hunt one down. For during the chase, you shall discover much. Now, does everyone have their wurgle pouches ready? Good. Because in those, I want you to place a handful of the mouse's fur. You will not be able to do any wurgling without it. The children were divided into smaller groups. Gamaliel found himself placed with the girl who had rescued him from Master Gibble's wrath. Her name was Lephidia. The other members of his group were a small boy named Tolly Chook and the Doolan brothers. When Gamaliel discovered that none other than Finn and Lufkin was to be their guide, he was filled with misgivings. 
In the two years since his training began, Finn and Lufkin had excelled at everything. Confronted with his sister's idol, Gamaliel was sure he would look even more foolish in comparison. Finnan grinned at Gamaliel. Don't let old Gibble put the wind up you. It's not as difficult as it sounds. Gamaliel managed a feeble smile. That was easy for Finnan to say. To make the hunt easier for the children, many of the adult whirlings were hidden throughout the wood. It was their job to act as beaters, driving mice from their holes and out into the open. When they heard the blowing of the school horn, they set about their work, and a fearsome din erupted. Over twisting roots and under fallen branches, Finn and Lufkin's little party hurried. The Doolans kept up with him easily, and Lafidia was close behind them. A little further back, Tollychook continuously switched his gaze from the way ahead to the sky above, just in case a kestrel had strayed from the heath and was hovering up there waiting to pounce upon him. Bringing up the rear, Gamaliel Tumpin huffed and panted. The others suddenly dived through a hedge of elder and feeling horribly alone, Gamaliel spurred himself forward. Into the gloom he plunged, then out into the bright sunlight again, and there he stumbled to a halt, staring delightedly about him. Gamaliel was standing upon a mossy bank, looking down into a small clearing filled with short grasses and the brown stems of last year's flowers. Lafidia, Mufus, Bufus and Tollichuk were close by, and they too could not believe their eyes, for the glade that Finn and Lufkin had led them to was swarming with mice. Driven from their homes by the beaters, it seemed that every mouse west of the Hagburn had poured into this clearing in their panicking flight. The place was alive with rustling movement and the piercing sound of confused squeaks and squeals. Oh, don't just stand there, Finnan laughed. Go catch one. Roused, the children gave a shout and went scrambling down the bank. At first... Bufus and Mufus were too busy acting the fool to be of any use whatsoever. They yelled and hollered, but were so busy giggling that the mice easily darted away from them. And poor Tollichuk possessed large feet, and he made such a trampling that no mouse ventured near him. Here, you little twitchers, he called to no avail. Come back! Gamaliel was also finding it far more difficult than he had supposed. The mice moved like lightning, and if he lunged forward to grab at a pink tail, his hands would grasp only empty air. Lafidia was more successful than any of them. She leapt and danced while the rodents coursed around her, speaking with gentle words, reaching out to stroke a furry back or tickle a silken ear. Not once did she try to catch one. Mufus and Bufus gave an exultant cheer and raised their hands to flaunt an unfortunate victim dangling from their fingers. Wriggling in terror, the small mouse cried pitifully. Ah, "'Tis only a tidgy one,' Mufus grumbled. "'Us can do better than that.' right oh," Bufus agreed and flung the astonished mouse back into the grass. At the far edge of the clearing were numerous bolt holes into which many mice would disappear, and sometimes Lafidia scooted in after them. Down unlit tunnels she ventured, the squeals echoing eerily around her. When they saw what she was doing, the Doolan brothers did the same and screamed and howled at one another throughout the length of their underground journeying. Up on the bank, even Finnan could hear their racketing progress. He knew that valuable lessons were being learnt, but the time had come for the tokens to be claimed. When Mufus and Bufus next appeared, grimy but grinning, he told them they had to concentrate on the task that Master Gibble had set. The twins darted back into the grass. Ha-ha! Mufus cried abruptly. Hoo-hoo! Bufus shrieked an instant later. Simultaneously, both boys lifted a frightened mouse above their heads and, seizing a handful of fur, gave a hard, sharp yank. A duet of pain erupted from their victims and the Doolans set the mice free, waving their trophies proudly. Well done, Finnan called, then jumped from the bank and hastened through the grass until he was standing at Lafidia's side. "'What are you doing?' he demanded. "'You've had plenty of chances.' Lafidia smiled at him. "'Do you really want me to trap one of these lovely creatures?' 
That's why we're here. Very well, she said, and springing forward, Lafidia wrapped her arms about a fleeing mouse's neck. She patted its head to quell its fear. Excellent, Finnan exclaimed. Now, pull a clump of fur out. I'll do no such thing, she retorted. It's cruel. But think of what old Gibble will say. Lafidia laughed. I don't care about that, she said. Then, kissing the mouse's nose, she let it go, and the creature sped away. Tollychook finally scooped up a mouse. Got you! I got you! he cried. Oh, my pretty squeaker, don't fight so! Wrestling with it, at last he seized hold of a fistful of soft, sleek hair and pulled. The mouse squealed, but then so did Tollychook, for even as the fur tore free, the rodent twisted about and bit his nose. Howling, the boy dropped both his attacker and his trophy. Only Gamaliel was left now, and Finnan went in search of him. Canella's brother was exhausted. He had not touched so much as a tail tip, and he puffed and wheezed, his face almost beetroot in colour. I can't do it, he sobbed. I'm no good for anything. I'm useless. Wipe your eyes, Finnan said gently. I'll help you. Follow me. Waving to the others to remain where they were, he led Gamaliel from the clearing and into the wide woodland. A fallen tree stretched across their path, and Finnan ran his fingers over the ivy leaves that covered it. Pulling the trailing growth aside, he revealed an opening in the fallen trunk, large enough for a whirling to clamber inside. Finnan whispered, Don't make a sound and say nothing. With that, he ducked under the leaves, and Gamaliel followed him in. A dim grey light filtered from the opening they had just crawled through. Finnan was treading carefully forward. Gently now, Finnan murmured. Peace, old one. Gamaliel stood on tiptoe and peered over his shoulder. It was the oldest mouse that Gamaliel had ever seen, the eyes almost blind. There we are, Finnan breathed as he caressed the aged animal's head. Enthralled, Gamaliel held his breath. It was obvious that the mouse's trust in Finnan was absolute. Too old to run with the others, weren't you? Finnan murmured. Same as you were back then, when I first found you. A shriveled paw dabbed at the air, and the boy chuckled warmly. <laughs> Not much today, he admitted, opening a leather bag attached to his belt. Just some dried apple pieces. The mouse gazed up at Finnan with its milky eyes, and the whirling smiled lovingly. At that moment, Gamaliel could hold his breath no longer and exhaled with a loud Pah! The mouse blinked at him. It's all right, Finnan assured it. This is another friend of mine. Placing the morsels of food on the floor, the old creature eased itself wearily down on its side and rolled over. It knew what was needed. Finnan beckoned to Gamaliel. Here, he said. Take fur from its back. Just below the mouse's shoulders was a bare patch of mottled skin. A few of the hairs had grown back, but the rodent was so ancient that most of the area had remained bald. Had someone else removed a scrap of fur? Is that why the animal knew what was required of it? Twining his fingers in the white fur, Gamaliel pulled as gently as he was able. The mouse gave a forlorn whimper when the hairs were extracted. There now, Finnan crooned, cupping the creature's face in his hands. It's over. You have been so brave. Bless you. Gamaliel shifted awkwardly. Yes, he began. Thank you. Finnan was stroking the mouse's nose. Rest now, he told it. I'll come back. You know that. Into a dark corner of its nest, the mouse retreated, its milky eyes fixed devotedly upon Finnan. So, 
Master Gibble announced. You have run and you have hunted. You have plucked out enough fur to serve as a token. All heads wagged, except for Lafidia's. The tutor's dark brows knitted tightly together. Child, did you obey my instruction and bring a token of mouse fur back with you? Lafidia took a deep breath. No, I did not. With every nostril flaring, he seized the girl by the shoulders. Explain, he demanded. It's cruel, she cried. I won't pull the fur out of any living creature. If that's what it takes to wurgle, then I don't want to be trained at all. Why can't I just learn to become a butterfly or a dragonfly instead? A gasp of horror issued from the mouths of the others, and the youngsters closest to her moved away. Oh, no, Finnan breathed. How can she not know? Even Gamaliel realised the dreadful mistake she had just made. A butterfly! Tursa Gibble shrieked. A dragonfly? How dare you harbour such desires? I don't understand, she said in a small voice. What's so wrong in that? The tutor's nostrils began to make a fizzing sound. One of the most important and basic rules of wurgling, he cried, is to know what is and is not permitted. Lafridia Nefin, the insect world, is denied to us. It is strictly forbidden. We must never, under any circumstances, be tempted to assume their form. Do you understand? Surely you have heard of Frighty Aggie? I thought... That was a make-believe monster to frighten the young. A discordant note whistled from Master Gibble's nose. Crickle, crackle, wurgle thee, stray not from the cobweb tree. Catch my brother or eat my mother, O oh, frighty Aggie, sting not me. Would that she were only a nursery bogle, he uttered darkly. But she is not. Beyond the hagburn she dwells, devouring what she finds in the darkness. Pray that she never returns to her old haunts to climb our trees and reach into our homes. What chance would you stand then against such a nightmare as she? The next time you yearn to be an insect, remember those words and shun such forbidden wishes. Spinning upon the bony heels of his bare feet, he marched back to the front, and commanded Lafidia to follow. As you have no token, you cannot take part in this, he informed her. Remain there and watch the progress of your fellows. You will have to catch up later. And so Lafidia was compelled to stand before the other children, while Master Gibble instructed them in the noble art of wurgling. Now, he began brusquely, this very day you will attempt your very first change of form. This is a gift we are born to, but for the novice there are many dangers. Most hazardous of all is to assume a shape, but be unable to return to your own. Does anyone know how to defend themselves against this hideous risk? Many hands shot up. The passwords! The passwords! Master Gibble clicked his tongue and waited for silence. Many years ago, he proclaimed, our ancestors devised words of power that could unlock whatever form they had taken. If you are in difficulty, then these mighty words will save you. They can also be invoked to aid any other of our kind, should they be trapped in a shape and unable to break free themselves. Whatever happens, the passwords must not be used frivolously or shouted aloud, lest enemies over here. When he next spoke, it was in a hushed, reverential whisper. Heed, then, he began. I shall tell to you the words of power, and you must commit them to the innermost regions of your heart. In silent rapture, the whirling youngsters listened intently. 
Amwin Parcavirian Soul, he sang softly. Olgun forweth Irakundor, Skarta nen Skilla Chin, Emma Werta, Ifimun Lo, Peron Lansa Diri Fin, Tartha Titha Dunrak. I won't never remember all them tongue tanglers, Tolly Chook moaned, giving voice to their concerns. Master Gibble regarded him haughtily. They were created in the old speech, he said, and in that form they possess the greatest strength. Yet there is a loose translation that may be easier for you to learn. It will be all you need at this stage of your instruction. Again, he adopted the low, respectful tone. I call on ye who lay beneath soil and sky, bark and leaf, Unyoke flesh, unbar door, cast off shape and wear no more. Give again the form that's good by the might of great Hagwood. <laughs> that's better, Tolly Chook cried. Unyoke flesh, unbar door, taint so tricky that, hm? Master Gibble's bony hand flashed out to smack Tolly Chook soundly across the back of the head. Idiot child! Do you want the world to hear? Speak not so loudly if you have to utter those words at all. And so, the moment has come, Master Gibble announced to the rest. Remove from your wurgle pouches the tufts of fur you have brought from the wood. Gamaliel reached into his velvety bag and took out the snowy fur. He saw Finnan grin encouragingly across at him. Attention, everyone. Tessa Gibble declared. You must recall what it was like to run with the beast you have hunted this day. Let your mind return to the chase. Fill your thoughts with that creature and concentrate on its form. Believe that you are mice. Then, when your imagination can do no more, take that handful of fur and hold it under your noses to take a great, inspiring whiff. As the smell and nature of the beast fills your nostrils, strain with all your might. Begin, he commanded. Eagerly, the young whirlings closed their eyes, and everyone thought back to the hunt, recalling as much as they could. A few of the children began to squeak in anticipation, while others muttered under their breath. Outside the gathering, Finn and Lufkin felt the atmosphere intensify. But as he stared at those reddening faces, watching the effort and exertion etched in the children's features, he gave a shiver and looked away guiltily. Tollichuk had screwed his face up so tightly that his eyes had disappeared, and his bottom lip was touching the underside of his nose, which he'd bandaged with a handkerchief. Perhaps it was the pain of that mouse bite which enabled him to remember so vividly the rodent that had wriggled in his arms. Suddenly he knew how the poor animal had felt. To run into the nearest hole and hide, with his whiskers trembling, was all he craved, and he let out a high shriek. Master Gibble stared at him gleefully. The token! he cried. Don't forget the token! Almost without realising what he was doing, Tolly Chook raised the fur in his hand to his nose and inhaled sharply. With that, he wurgled. A lustrous coat of fur sprouted all over his skin. His breeches flew off as a pink tail whisked into existence behind him, and his jerkin was sent flying into the branches overhead when he thrashed his dwindling arms, squeaking in amazement when he stared at the paws that had replaced his hands. The mouse, that was now trying to control the movements of its tail, was still recognisably tollichook. It had the same nose and mouth, and the ears were not quite right. Adequate for a first attempt the tutor commented. Let us hope it will improve with practice. All at once, the rest of the youngsters gave astonished cries. Fistfuls of fur were sniffed and pink tails came sweeping from their clothes. His eyes clamped shut. Gamaliel Tumpin heard the marvellous transformations erupt around him and his anxiety mounted. Come on, Gamaliel! Canella's impatient call came ringing in his ears. Hurry up! 
Her brother was frantic. Desperately, he struggled to imagine he was a mouse. Please, 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 he begged, his voice cracking with effort and emotion. Clutching the tuft of white fur to his nose, he took an enormous breath and doubled over. He felt his knees begin to shake, and a curious buzzing filled his mind. This was it, he thought. The wurgling was beginning, and his heart soared. Rejoicing, he leapt up, waiting for the tail to burst out behind. Yet the miracle never happened. Instead of turning into a rodent, Gamaliel Tumpin swayed dizzily and staggered backwards. Did it work? He mumbled with a slur. Um, um, I, a mouse. A prickling darkness engulfed him, and Gamaliel went crashing to the floor. He had fainted. It was dark when Finn and Lufkin ascended the mighty oak in which the Tumpin family lived. Overhead, he could see the faint glow of a lantern spilling out along the branches. A solitary, plump figure was sitting there humming softly. Gamaliel? Finnan called. Is that you? The figure started. Hello, Finnan. What are you doing here at this late hour? Evening, Canella. I came to see how your brother was doing. Is he feeling any better? The girl yawned. Don't care. Ain't no one never swooned wurgling before. Did you hear how that stooky muffin giggled? Where is... Gamaliel? Canella pointed upwards. In his favourite spot, she said. Likes to go and watch the world from up there, especially when he's done something gormless or he's downright glum. <laughs> Seems to me as how that's most of the time. Finnan hurried up the oak's uppermost boughs to where, sitting upon the last twig strong enough to support him, was Gamaliel Tumpin. This was his special private place where he could gaze out across the forest roof and lose himself in dreams. You going to sit there feeling sorry for yourself all night? Finnan asked, suddenly. Gamaliel turned, and the twigs swayed beneath him. I don't want none of your pity. Finnan shrugged. Well, I wasn't going to offer any. Came to see if you fancied joining me on an excursion tonight. It doesn't matter. I can easily go on my own. The elder boy chinned down the branch. Wait! Gamaliel cried. Where are you off to? Finnan chuckled. <laughs> Only way to find out is to come with me. Gamaliel scrambled from the bobbing twigs and followed Finnan down. The route Finnan took avoided the branch where Canella sat in waiting. Then, into the soft leaf mould piled over the tree's roots, he dropped, followed by Gamaliel. Gamaliel gazed apprehensively around at the moon-glimmering darkness. It looked so different. I don't know if I dare. Finnan began walking down the slope. You'll be perfectly safe for me to guide you, he promised. I've roamed in the dark hundreds of times before. <laughs> if you're sure, Gamaliel said, scampering after him. We going to see that old mouse again? Before Finnan could answer, there was Canella. Arms folded and annoyed. Don't you try and slip off without me, she said crossly. If you don't let me join you, I'll tell. There was nothing Finnan could do but allow her to accompany them. Under the towering black columns of the trees they journeyed, travelling northward, quite the opposite direction to the one Gamaliel had supposed, and the unfamiliar sights, smells and sounds alarmed and thrilled him. At length... The trees began to thin on their left, and Gamaliel caught a glimpse of the cinder track beyond. He stared fearfully through the outlying oaks. That neglected trail marked the edge of his world. The cinder track was left behind, and Gamaliel heard the sounds of flowing water. They were drawing near to the Hagburn. Oh, Finnan, Canella chided. It's not allowed to jump the stream and go into the big forest. You know that. Don't worry, he said. This is as close as we get to the Hagburn. Pass those birches yonder and we'll be done. End 
of side one. Side two. Rearing like pillars of marble, glowing faintly in the moonlight, a row of birch trees formed a long colonnade through the wood. The whirlings scampered between the coldly glimmering trunks and stared about them. Canella pulled a face. The woodland looked no different in front of the birches. Nothing special here at all, except for a grassy path that wound deep into the forest. Her brother was not so easily discouraged. Close by, a large boulder jutted from the ground, and curious, Gamaliel pattered over to inspect it. The rock was many times his height. Up to the sky the black shape jabbed, like the tip of an enormous sword threatening the starry heavens. It's called the Hag's Finger, Finnan informed him, a do-it stone. It marks the northernmost boundary of Whirlingland. There's scratches gouged into it down here, Gamaliel chirped suddenly. Do it writing, Finnan said. It were the do-its who put the hag's finger here. Oh, who were they? Gamaliel asked. Big folk who lived clear over the other side of Hagwood. Very wise they were, but cruel with it. Canella stamped her feet. You mean to say we've come all this way to look at a giant pebble? No. This is only where we're going to wait. You'll see a lot more. I swear it. What we see, she cried, what? Hush, the boy told her. From now on, we must only talk in whispers. Don't you know what night this is? Mm. The night we get warmed leftovers, Canella said with a grimace. The boy sighed. During the year, there are certain times which are special, when strange things happen. You must have heard tell of the folk who live in the great green hill. The lords and ladies, Gamaliel cried. I done heard all the stories our dad knows. I loves to hear about them with their jewels and crowns and magic. Finnan smiled. Well, it's obvious that your father didn't tell you one story, the one about the trooping raid. Those four nights of the year when the hollow hill opens up and the unseely court is compelled to ride forth. This very night is one of those four. From the hill, the High Lady and her nobles range through Hagwood, passing this very spot. I've always meant to come and see, but never have. A gurgle of bliss bubbled from Gamaliel's lips. How do you know all this? Canella asked. If it's true, why ain't there more come here to gawk? My old nan told me. You ever want to hear a real cracking yarn, you go ask her. Now, quick, he hissed excitedly. Make sure you're well hidden behind the rock. See, over there. The Tompins looked where his quivering fingers were pointing. In the distance, through the trees, many lights were flickering. The lamps of the hollow hill had green flames, and because the bearers were still too far away to see, it seemed as if they were floating upon the shadow-filled air. The whirlings were struck with awe and fear, not wishing to be seen, yet aching to see all. Canella pulled the neck of her snookle hood over her nose, while Finnan took shallow breaths and became as still as the stone that concealed him. Soon... The woodland was awash with the radiance of the underground realm. The figures were so tall and menacing that Gamaliel wanted to shriek and run away. He'd never seen any creature so large. Yet in spite of his fears, he remained where he was, terrified and enchanted. At the forefront of the fairy host marched a band of pages. These were Cluries. Squat creatures with broad, flat heads and tiny darting eyes. They were dressed in blood-red velvet with golden buttons, and in their large hands they bore slender poles from which silver lanterns hung. Next came the esquires, blue-faced bogles, every one, their pallid skins ashen grey in the glow of the lanterns, which were fashioned into the crests of their bronze helms. They were taller than the pages and wore leather hauberks painted with the emblem of the High Lady, a black owl wearing a golden crown. Over their shoulders they bore cruel-looking spears with jagged blades. Then came the goblin knights, ghastly to behold. 
The grim features that poked from beneath their plumed helmets were covered in grey scales, and their eyes were dark hollows in which no glint of reflected light could be seen. Lances tipped with gold were carried in their clawed hands, and round shields bearing the owl badge were lashed across their shoulders. Their coal-black steeds were bedecked in armour, and their eyes burnt with scarlet fire. The forest floor was pounded by their silver-shod hooves, and as they paraded past, a ray of red shone full onto Gamaliel's face. Horrified, he ducked, expecting the nightmare to thunder over him and smash his bones into the soil. But when he next dared to raise his head, he saw that the knights had gone, and a new regiment of fearsome folk were passing the Dewitt Stone. There marched the Red Caps, the High Lady's hideous foot soldiers. Over their bald, bony skulls they wore tight-fitting hats that were steeped in blood, which had dribbled down their foul faces, staining their pig-like snouts. The steeds which followed the Red Caps were grey as a rain-soaked dawn, and upon their backs rode the nobles of the Hollow Hill and Gamaliel forgot the fear that the preceding folk had instilled in him. The lords and ladies of the court were the fairest creatures he had ever seen. Sumptuously arrayed in velvet cloaks, trimmed with lustrous fur, clasped about their necks by brooches set with gems that flashed in the lamplight. Every face was proud and haughty, but they owned an ethereal beauty. Trampling behind came the royal bodyguard. They were Spriggans, fierce fighters, clad from head to toe in clinking mail. Every warty jaw was crammed with needle-sharp fangs, and swords twice the length of themselves were carried upon their backs. Great was their number, and in their midst, riding a silver-white mare, was the most stunning vision of all. There! Finnan murmured in a hallowed whisper. That must be her, the High Lady herself, Rhiannon of the Green Hill. Even Canella gasped with amazement, and Gamaliel felt as though he wanted to cry. Beneath a silken canopy, embroidered with jewels and golden thread, rode a woman as lovely as a winter night. Her raven hair was like a trailing cloud of storm, and a circlet of gold sat lightly upon her pale brow. The unearthly light of the hidden realm bloomed in her cheeks, and her eyes, dark and keen, pierced the surrounding gloom, laying all secrets bare. Yet they were not turned to the Dewitt Stone. When she drew level with the hag's finger, the whirling saw that upon the lap of the Lady Rhiannon was a small figure. What is it? Gamaliel breathed. A mortal infant, taken to the hollow hill many years ago. If he were ever to return to his own kind, then old age would claim him, and death would follow. Into the forest the cavalcade journeyed, and the woodland behind was plunged back into darkness. There was no indication that the unseely court had gone by, not a blade of grass was broken, and the soil showed no sign of hoof marks. Gamaliel stared into the night shrouded forest, then turned to his new friend. Thank you for showing me this, he said. Not being able to wurgle into a mouse don't seem half as important anymore. Returning through the birches, Gamaliel felt a lot happier and delighted in picking up odds and ends from the woodland floor. Into his wurgle pouch he popped them, wispy tufts of hares, tails, stray feathers, another pebble. Canella watched her brother disapprovingly. I don't know why you bother with him, she said. Finnan fingered his own wurgle pouch. When I was his age, I was more nervous and hopeless than Gamaliel, he told her. I wish that there'd been someone to help me then, someone to steer me on the right track and encourage me. Things might have worked out a lot differently. He sighed, dismally, and Canella scratched her head in confusion. But you're the best at everything, she cried. The hero of the whirling children avoided her eyes, brooding 
on the awful crime he had committed. His secret was far too shameful to tell anyone. Brilliant sunshine flooded through the trees that grew west of the Hagburn. That morning all spirits were high, and in the hazel tree the young whirlings were treated to a wurgling display by the older children who changed themselves into all manner of small woodland creatures, stoats, snails, squirrels and voles, rats and several unsuccessful finches and sparrows. Master Gibble eyed the dismal birds. If your ambition compels you to attempt forms that are beyond your capabilities, do not presume to parade the disastrous results before me. He turned to Finnan, who had not changed into anything at all. And you, Master Lufkin, he said, will you be joining your fellows? Or is that beneath you nowadays? I didn't know where to begin, the boy replied honestly. Are there indeed so many forms in your repertoire? Master Gibble asked archly. Yes, Finnan said, much to the tutor's annoyance. There are. A soft, whistling peep escaped from one of Master Gibble's nostrils. Would you care to demonstrate, he hissed, if it isn't too much trouble? Ignoring the sarcasm, Finnan agreed, and removing the wurgle pouch from his belt, he let it fall to the floor. Won't be needing that, he said. Cursor Gibble trembled with indignation. A moment, he cried. I suggest that we both wurgle together and see who falters first. Finnan knew there was no way out. Very well, he assented. The other whirlings ran to their seats forming a clear stage where the contest could take place. From the simplest through to the most sophisticated, the spindly tutor announced. Master Gibble struck a flamboyant pose and his shape dissolved effortlessly down into the black creases of his gown. A scrawny mouse with an inordinately long nose popped his head from the collapsing robe and scurried free. Squeaking with vain pride, he turned, but saw that Finnan had already wurgled, and his mouse was staring back at him. With an irritated toss of the head, the tutor wurgled into a hedgehog. But with impertinent ease, Finnan was wurgling into many different species. From a wood mouse, he blended his shape into that of a dormouse. Then he became a harvest mouse, and with a flick of his ears, slipped into a grey house mouse. The spines covering Master Gibble's hedgehog shape quivered and the tutor transformed into a skinny rat. He ran at the mouse to cuff his head. Too late, he saw Finnan assume the hedgehog form, and he drove his paws onto sharp bristles. Squealing, the tutor's outline rippled as the remaining primitive forms were rapidly dispensed with in their correct order, from squirrel through to mole, matched by Finnan. The watching children gasped with wonder as the specialist section of the tournament commenced. At once... Master Gibble became a cream-coloured ferret, but Finnan expertly eclipsed the move by wurgling into a green and yellow frog. The ferret vanished, and in its place was a newt peppered with dark spots. Finnan's frog leapt over the newt's head, but when he landed, he had become a lanky-legged leveret that hopped madly about the platform, taunting the newt. <laughs> That's it, Finnan, the Doolan brothers called. You're showing the old misery. The newt glared at them but Mufus and Bufus only snickered. The newt started to chase its tail. A moment later, the glistening body had stretched in length, and there, upon the deck, was an adder, its long tongue flicking. The Doolans shuffled backwards, and Canella's mouth dropped open. Finnan's young hare was still oblivious to the new and deadly change that had occurred behind him. He continued to caper while the snake reared its scaly head. Frightened whimpers issued from the audience, but at the crucial moment... The leveret reached up with its front legs and two webs of leathery skin unfurled. With a downward thrust of his new wings, the bat that Finnan had transformed into flitted up into the overhanging branches of the hazel. There, he acquired a perfect covering of feathers and perched upon one of the boughs as a woodlark. He can do feathers, the children cried. And he can fly! Canella crowed. Oh, Finnan! Overhead, 
The woodlark sang a piping cadence of notes as a finale. The whirling children applauded enthusiastically and rose to their feet. The snake's lidless eyes considered the sweetly singing bird for a moment. Then the familiar, gangly figure of Master Gibble was standing there, wrapping his gown about him once more. A sombre expression was etched upon his face, and the tutor bowed so low to Finnan that his nose touched the floor and bent sideways. "'Your skill is indeed very great. Never have I had the privilege to teach any pupil with such a gift as yours. You will be one of the grand adepts, Master Lufkin.' The woodlark hopped from his perch, and Finnan jumped onto the platform as himself, wishing he had never allowed himself to be persuaded into the foolish contest. Master Gibble returned to the serious matters of the day. Tonight, you younger students will venture out into the wood and commence the next stage of instruction. In the same groups as yesterday, you will study the second animal on the wurgling list, the hedgehog. I want you to learn its ways and return at daybreak with a token of prickly bristles to add to your wurgle pouches. Most of the impatient children were put to bed in the afternoon, but Lafidia Neffin was made to repeat the previous day's exercise. With Master Gibble standing over her, she caught a mouse and miserably plucked out a small amount of fur, then wurgled beautifully into one. Impressed for the second time that day, the tutor was compelled to send her home to prepare for the next lesson. Evening came at last. Streaks of scarlet striped the sky as the sun dipped behind the gathering clouds, and for a time Hagwood appeared aglow with angry flame. Finnan led them along much the same route as the previous night's journey, and when the edge of the woodland was in sight and the heath dimly visible beyond, he called a halt. By the roots of an ash tree they made their encampment. It's as likely a spot as any, he said, setting the lantern down. Our prickly friends always come foraging between the wood and the heath. Mufus Doolan stared out at the tantalising expanse of the heath and whistled longingly. Bet there's more hedgehogs in all that grass than you can find trundling through these leaves, his brother agreed wholeheartedly. I'm going to go and see. Sit down, Finnan told them. No one's going over there. That wasteland is far too exposed. You'd be an owl's supper before you knew what had happened. How long will it be before we see a hedgehog? Lafidia asked. Finnan shrugged. Mm, could be ours yet. What are we going to do till then? Bufus complained. I could tell you a story, if you like, Finnan suggested. Mm, what about a tale of the hill folk? Gamaliel asked. No, Lafidia interrupted. I'd like to know more about Frighty Aggie. That particular tale was not one he would relish telling. Oh, I'm not sure I remember it properly. Course you do, the Doolans urged. We like that one, we do. Glancing round at the darkened wood, Finnan shivered. There were elements of the tale that touched too closely on his own secrets, but he could not deny the demands of his group now. With the night close about them, the whirlings huddled before the lantern, and Finnan commenced the tragic history of Frighty Aggie. In long years past, the boy said, the instructor of the young was called Agnilla Helikin, one of the finest champions of the art that our kind has ever known. There was not a creature in the forest beyond the range of her powers, yet she was not content. Agnilla's thoughts turned to the insect world, yet from our early beginnings that branch of law has been forbidden us, and our legend spoke of Wurgle masters who dabbled in such experiments and of the horror that befell them. Wurgling into an insect, the mind of a whirling alters, and he forgets his former existence. Agnilla considered herself far too skilled to succumb to such hazards. Her gift surpassed that of any who had gone before. Yet, to ensure her triumph, she, um, Finn had faltered and hastily cleared his throat. What did she do? Lafidia asked. Thought 
she could um, cheat, the boy answered clumsily. And for a while it worked. The first insect she wurgled into was a huge and beautiful moth that sailed silently between the trees with the moonlight scattering over her fragmented eyes. The other whirlings were amazed and honoured her as the mightiest that had ever lived. Twice more she transformed into insect forms, then on that third and last time her powers failed her and she became a monstrous hybrid terror, part wasp, part spider. The other whirlings called out the unlocking passwords, but they were useless, for the frightful shape that Agnella had assumed was entirely new, and over it those ancient charms had no control. Her mind and will had fallen into that of the hideous nightmare she had become. The whirlings were forced to drive the vile creature from the wood and out over the hagburn, and there, in the deep forest, behind the holly fence, she made her awful abode. And it is said, she dwells there still. Frighty Aggie. Oh, Frighty Aggie. Sting not me, Gamaliel murmured with a shiver. Tollichuk glanced round warily, as if he expected the terrible monster to suddenly spring from the gloom. Now, I understand why Gibble was so angry, Lafidia breathed. Mother should have told me the story years ago. Perhaps she thought you'd had enough nightmares, Finnan said. What with your father being carried off and all. The girl eyed him somberly. And didn't stop your grandmother telling it to you, she replied. Both your parents are dead, aren't they? Finnan hung his head and said no more. <laughs> Frighty Aggie, Mufus Stoolan wailed. Oh, I'd love to see that lair of hers. Mufus jumped to his feet. Dare you to go to the holly fence? Do you think we'd spot her from there? His brother asked. Bet we could, and I bet she stinks. Nobody's going anywhere, Finnan stated firmly, especially not to the holly fence. You must never, ever go that way, do you understand? The brothers sneered. Mm, it's only a balmy old story, Mufus moaned. She'd be long dead by now, even if it was true. Oh, it's true, all right, Finnan snapped, and the bitterness in his voice startled everyone. At that moment, Tollichuk leapt up and frantically pointed over their heads into the wood. Look! Look! He squealed. A hideous fear gripped the others, and they whirled about. Sting not me, Bufus pleaded as he fell on his face. What is it? Finnan hissed, unable to see anything monstrous lurking in the shadowy dark. Tollichuk stared at their frightened faces, and in a small, abashed voice muttered, There's a hedgehog over there. And so the strained mood was dispelled, and laughing, the whirlings ran from the roots of the ash and deeper into the wood with their new companion, carefully observing its movements. The night wore on, and often the hedgehog would pause to snout and sift the leaves with its glistening nose, searching for grubs and beetles. Once it found a large slug, which it chewed happily and stickily for several minutes. Mm, that's disgusting, that bee! Tollichuk exclaimed. Finnan chuckled. Don't speak too soon. Sometimes when you wurgle into a shape and stay that way for a while, you get the funniest cravings. I've eaten lots of blue bottles. The children shrieked in revulsion. But the laughter died on Finnan's lips and his face fell. Where are they? he cried, staring this way and that. How long have they been gone? Only then did the others realise that Mufus and Bufus were nowhere to be found. When was the last time anyone saw them? he cried desperately. Oh, I, I heard one of them whisper something two beetles ago, Lafidia said. I couldn't hear what it was, but didn't think anything of that. They're always muttering to one another. That can't have been more than an hour since. If we set off right away, we might be able to catch up with them. Dragging his fingers through his hair, Finnan gave a yell of anger. Idiots! Are they mad? Tollichuk fidgeted awkwardly. Where do you think they've gone, then? To the holly fence. To find... Frighty Aggie.
Through the night-wrapped wood the whirlings raced, their hearts pounding with fear and dread. Deep into the trees Finnan led them, until at last they heard the rushing of water and came to the hagburn. Staring down at the stream, Gamaliel felt awfully afraid. The reflected light of the lantern sparkled like liquid fire down there, but when he lifted his gaze to the far bank, all was darkness and strangling shadow. Do we have to go across? Tollichuk yelped at the very thought of venturing into that untamed forest, but they all knew that it was the only way. There are plenty of leaning boughs to use as bridges, Finnan said, shining the lantern further downstream. We must hurry. Along the mossy edge of the high bank the whirlings ran, to where the first of many branches stretched from the far side to their own. It was almost as if the ugly, twisted trees of the forest had been trying to stealthily creep across, and Gamaliel shuddered at the unwelcome notion, yet into that fearsome realm they were bound to go. Minutes later, standing upon a hostile shore, Gamaliel looked at the unfamiliar trees. There was nothing beautiful in any of them. They were grasping, distorted giants that vied against and throttled their neighbours in what was evidently a daily struggle for light. Beneath the contorted boughs, the air was stuffy and oppressive, oozing between the grotesquely proportioned trunks as a turgid black vapour. From here on, we have to go in the dark, Finnan's voice cut through Gamaliel's thoughts. I don't risk a light. There are too many eyes this side of the stream. Keep your sticks handy, but let's hope we won't need them. Lifting the lantern, he closed its small door. At once, the imprisoning bars of night snapped in around them. We mustn't even call out the Doolan's names, Finnan warned. It's too dangerous. It was a distressing, floundering journey that seemed to take forever in the engulfing murk. Southward they pressed drawing no ease from the foreign noises of the forest, which all sounded bleak and menacing. Surely we should have found them by now, Lafidia breathed. I think they simply got bored and went home. Too late to turn back, Finnan spoke in a soft whisper. We're here. Rising before them was a wall of solid darkness that towered far above the highest branches and curved deep into the forest. The holly fence, Gamaliel murmured. A fortress built from spiky, leathery leaves and choking, knotted growth. It was a bastion of despair. I, I shall never get through there, Tollichuk warbled. Do you really believe Friday Aggie is still alive? Gamaliel whispered nervously. Taking a step closer, Finnan took a few moments to answer. If she is... Then she's right behind this, he said grimly. But Mufus and Bufus aren't, Lafidia insisted. Even if they came this far, they would have turned back. This is an evil place. The others agreed. The atmosphere was charged with malice, and from the holly fence there floated a faint reek of death and corruption. You're right, Finnan decided. Let's go back quickly. When I catch hold of those two truants... Before he could finish, a pitiful cry came echoing from beyond the vast hedge, and the whirlings stared at one another in horror. They are in there, Finnan hissed. Tollichuk backed away in terror. She's eating them! Finnan rushed forward and frantically sought for a way through the evergreen bulwark. Dropping to his knees, he groped at the tangled stems. I can get in here! He called over his shoulder. Wait, Lafidia urged. There's nothing you can do against her. The anguished cry was sent up once more. It was a ghastly, blood-freezing scream, filled with horror and pain. Finnan dived into the gap and the holly fence swallowed him. Crouched by the opening, Lafidia knew she could not let him go alone. With her heart in her mouth, she hurried after Singing the childhood rhyme to ward the nightmare of Frighty Aggie away, Tollichuk sobbed, and Gamaliel felt helpless. I can't just stand here waiting, Gamaliel blurted, already squeezing into the gap and blubbering dismally. Tollichuk followed. Through the narrow, scratching tunnel of holly they pushed, 
the shiny leaves jabbing into their faces and snagging their clothes. The repulsive stench became stronger, and Finner nearly yelled when his fingers met a clinging, sticky spider's thread. A sickly grey radiance glimmered between the dense leaves in front, and bracing himself for the hideous unknown, he plunged straight through them and stumbled to a standstill. A loathsome scene was unveiled. Beyond the mighty barricade of holly stretched a wide clearing. Towards one remote corner the ground rose steadily, and there, thrusting up from that parched mound, was the lair of frighty Aggie. It was a massive dead tree, whose bark was blighted by disease and blasted by lightning. The crippled boughs corkscrewed their way from one side of the curving hedge to the other, forming the rafters of a misshapen roof, and beneath them the malformed trunk was punctured with dozens of dark and gaping holes. Cold with fear, Finnan eyed those ominous entrances, as Lafidia emerged from the leaves behind him and instantly recoiled. All around the clearing, like macabre and spectral bunting, were swathes of old and filthy webs that clung to every twisting branch. But not all the threads were old and coated with grime. In that ghostly light, many were fresh and glistening. Gamaliel and Tollichuk joined them, and when their eyes adjusted to the ghastly glare, they saw that hanging from the branches were countless cocooned bundles. None of them had ever felt so afraid. It's her larder, Gamaliel breathed feeling sick and faint. Suspended from slender ropes and bound in suffocating webs were the festering remains of Frytiagi's victims, the shriveled bodies of mice and voles, a sparrow's beak or weasel's foot. All the captured prey of Frytiagi was here. Sucked the goodness clean out of them all, Tollichuk wept. Wrenching his gaze away, Finnan searched for any sign of Mufus and Bufus, but the brothers were nowhere to be seen. Anxiously, he wondered if they'd been dragged into one of those holes in the tree and were even now being devoured in the dark. A mournful shriek suddenly threw his suspicions aside, and finally they saw where those cries originated. Across the clearing was a fox cub, trussed tightly. It was hanging upside down, its eyes rolling in terror. Another mewling call escaped its jaws when it beheld once more the frightful thing suspended nearby, and realising what it was, Tollichuk retched and looked away. Swinging slowly upon a silvery string, like some grisly pendulum, was a second cub, but it was dead and half-eaten, and the ground beneath was stained and spattered with blood. Finnan pushed the others back against the holly fence. The Doolans... We're never here, he muttered. We have to go. That poor fox is still alive, Lafidia declared. I'm not abandoning it to be eaten. And before anyone could stop her, she darted to the other side of the clearing to where the fox cub was twirling woefully and its amber fear-filled eyes fixed beseechingly upon her. Be calm now, she called softly, avoiding the red stains on the ground. I'll rescue you. Leaving Tollichuk and Gamaliel behind, Finnan ran to fetch her back. Leaping up, Lafidia caught hold of the fox's binding cords to yank the animal free, but to her dismay she discovered that her hands were held fast to the cocoon. I'm stuck, she cried. The webs are like glue. Grasping her wrists, Finnan pulled fiercely, but it made no difference. The petrified fox let out a grievous yowl. With a wary glance at the monster's hideous abode, Finnan wurgled into a woodpecker. Up the bird flew to where the tip of the cub's tail poked from the sticky bindings and the suspending strand stretched into the overhanging branches. In one swift, scissoring movement, the woodpecker's beak snipped it in two. Lafidia fell backwards and the fox cub tumbled on top of her. Down Finnan swooped, wurgling into a stoat whose sharp claws set to work immediately. From the fox's body, the tight ensnaring webs were torn, and the young animal wheezed its gratitude while Lafidia wiped the filthy stuff from her hands. But the real peril was just beginning. Staring at the blood-stained ground, 
Finnan noticed that it had not completely seeped into the dry soil. We interrupted her. Frighty Aggie was feeding when we got here. She must have heard us and slunk away. Where to? Lafidia breathed. Only then did Finnan see a trail of dark red splashes leading from the mire beneath the fox's dead sibling. Crimson droplets sprinkled the stones, heading towards the tree until suddenly the dribble ceased. And at last he knew. Aggie had climbed into the branches above. Run! he yelled. Leave the fox and run as fast as you can back to the hedge! Lafidia didn't understand what had happened. Finnan looked terrified. Gamaliel and Tolichuk didn't know what had come over him either, and didn't know that directly behind them a single glistening thread was steadily descending. Do as I tell you, Finnan was shouting at Lafidia. Leave it! We don't have much time! The girl shoved him away from her. I won't! Spinning around to face the holly fence, she prepared to call out to Gamaliel and Tolichuk but the plea became a horrified scream. Gamaliel and Tollichuk whirled about, and at last they saw it, the nightmare that haunted the dark dreams of whirling infants, Frighty Aggie. Down the silvery rope she had stealthily been creeping, but now those noisy morsels were aware of her and squealing shrilly, not waiting to scale the remaining distance, Frighty Aggie pounced. She was the most abhorrent vision that any of the Whirlings had ever conceived. In the ages since she had been driven over the Hagburn, she had grown immense in size, a frightful fusion of wasp and spider. Her bloated body was a livid, poisonous yellow, striped by ugly black bands. Eight enormous jointed legs arched high over her large, swivelling head, where clustering eyes bulged with greed. Onto the ground she leapt, and her jaws clicked feverishly together as she bore down upon Gamaliel and Tollichuk. In one hideous moment, it was over. Shrieking, Canella's brother was flung to the floor and Tollichuk slammed against the stones beside him. Over their bodies the apparition crawled, trussing them in her clinging cords. Tollichuk bawled despairingly, but there was no escape. As soon as they were securely imprisoned, Frighty Aggie turned her malignant attention upon those others who had dared to raid her pantry. Over the iron-hard ground the fiend came ravening, her talons clattering on the stones as she lunged for the stricken whirlings. The fox cub howled. Then, at the last moment, as the shadow of Frighty Aggie fell upon them, Finnan shook himself. Snatching up a large stone, he hurled it at the lunging head, and an outraged screech issued from the virulent jaws. Aggie pursued him. She would feast upon that dainty first of all. Luring the frightful adversary away from Lafidia and the fox cub, Finnan sped to the centre of the clearing. But Aggie's eight legs carried her swiftly, and he realised it was impossible to outrun her. He had to keep her occupied so that the others could escape, and so, when the chill shadow engulfed him, he knew there was only one thing he could do. He wurgled into a shrew. The terrible jaws came snapping down, but instead of fleeing from her, the shrew raced between her talons and scuttled beneath that venom-gorged belly. Aggie reared in fury and spun around in a rage, but the shrew hid from her evil glance and nipped in and out of her legs, constantly avoiding those glittering eyes. A bubbling hiss spewed from her jaws as she vainly tried to seize him, but Finnan was too nimble. And though the stench of her foul flesh screamed in his nostrils, he endured it stoically. Lafidia could not bear to watch. Springing across to where Tollichuk and Gamaliel were squirming in their cocoons, Lafidia tore a large holly leaf from the hedge and used its sharp spikes to rip through the clinging bonds. When their arms and legs were freed, Gamaliel and Tollichuk staggered to their feet. They stared at Frighty Aggie still reeling in the drunken dance that Finn and Shrew obliged her to perform. But now the monster was jabbing the ground furiously with her sting, and Finnan was tiring. He's not going to last much longer, Lafidia cried. Oh, what shall us do? Tolly Chook blubbered. What shall us do? Retrieving his stick from the floor where it had fallen, Gamaliel brandished it fiercely. We've got to help him, he shouted. 
and waving the pathetic weapon over his head, he rushed to attack Freitiagi, yelling at the top of his voice as Finnan shrieked in pain. So great was his agony that the shrew shape vanished, and there he lay, the fiend's claw skewering his right arm. Slavering putrid fluids, Aggie lowered her jaws, and they clacked together eagerly. Get off him! Gamaliel screeched. Let him be! With all his might, he brought the stick cracking down against the enemy's black and yellow body. Keeping her victim pinned to the ground, the repugnant creature lifted her malignant head and turned. Lafidia and Tolichuk had already joined Gamaliel, and they too were assailing her ulcerous bulk. Spinning about, she confronted them and lashed out viciously. Another of her great claws punched Tolichuk in the stomach, and he screamed when it flicked him into the air. He hurtled up into the branches, where he was instantly entangled in the thick webs and couldn't get down. In desperation, Gamaliel clouted one of the gargantuan legs, but the stick splintered upon that adamantine shell. Only Lafidia's frantic efforts inflicted any injury. When the dark head came swinging around, she brought her stick crashing into a cluster of eyes, and a bitter screech blasted from the fetid jaws. It was the first true pain that Freitiagi had suffered in an age and more. Boiling with murderous wrath, she rounded upon the whirling girl and dashed the weapon from her hands. Lafidia fell back, and the apparition towered over her, the evil sting pulsed in readiness to strike. Gamaliel gave a shout and leapt forward, straight into the hideous sting's path. The lethal spike descended, crushing him to his knees. He squealed in agony when the atrocity stabbed into his shoulder. Deeply bit the unholy sting, and when Aggie heaved herself up, once more it tore from her body. Into Gamaliel's veins her pollution pumped, and he collapsed, senseless and deathly still. Speared beneath the claw, Finnan heard the shrieks of his friends and roused himself for one final effort. Using all his fading strength, he strained hard and changed his shape into that of a rat with long, razor-sharp teeth. Twisting around, he lifted his head and clamped his incisors about the apparition's claw. A revolting crack rang out in the clearing and the rat's teeth crunched clean through the talon, cheering it off. Dark green blood came frothing from the truncated limb and gushed, steaming upon the ground. Gagging on the odious taste, the rat slumped back. His last spark of energy quenched. Finnan wurgled back into his usual shape. There was no hope left. Frighty Aggie stood over Finnan's prostrate form, her eyes blazing with hatred. The loathly head bent down and over his wincing features... The ragged antennae raked, and a purling gargle sounded behind the clicking jaws. A pale, luminous light flickered in Frighty Aggie's searching eyes when the probing antennae caressed a small leather bag attached to the whirling's belt. A thin, mocking laugh floated down to him, and with that, to Finnan's bewilderment, she left him. Back over the stony ground, the horrendous creature crept, a cold, creaking laughter echoing across that drear, death-plagued place and up the mound. Finnan tugged the dismembered claw from his arm and saw Frighty Aggie haul her vile bulk into one of the diseased tree's many dark holes. There was no time to ponder on why she had departed at the very moment of her victory. Confused and weary, Finnan stumbled to his feet and staggered across to where Lafidia was kneeling beside Gamaliel. The girl lifted her head, her cheeks streaked with tears. I... I think he's dead. The fox cub began to howl again. Angrily, Finnan reached out to draw the vile sting from his dead friend's body. Suddenly, a stern, unfamiliar voice shouted, Don't be a fool, boy! The whirling spun around to see a tall, shadowy figure come crashing into the clearing. Are you so ignorant of the were hag's ways? it demanded. Who are you? Finnan yelled. Keep away! The stranger stepped closer. He was four times the height of the whirlings, but Finnan rose to confront him. 
You'll not be much use in a fight with that poor arm of yours now, the newcomer said gruffly, pulling a small knife from his belt and springing forward. Pushing Finnan out of the way, he raised the blade above Gamaliel's body and plunged it into his flesh. Lefidia shrieked and flew at him, but Finnan pulled her off. Wait, he told her. Look what he's doing. Startled, the girl watched as the knife sliced a red circle in Gamaliel's shoulder, deftly carving out the flesh in which the sting was impaled. A leathery hand was then clamped over the hollow wound, and Fritiagi's ghastly weapon was flung away in disgust. Returning his attention to the whirlings, a solemn smile appeared in the newcomer's grizzled beard. You'll uh, forgive Smith's manners, he excused himself, but if you'd pulled that accursed tickler from your friend, he'd be well dead by now. Ophidia and Finnan gazed at the wandering smith in astonishment. Are you saying Gamaliel's still alive? Um, barely. Picking Gamaliel from the floor, he strode back across the clearing to the great hole he had made in the holly fence. Smith has pitched his camp yonder, he told them, sweeping the fox cub up in his other arm. He can do more for your companion there. Nursing his own wound, Finnan began to hurry after the smith, but Lafidia hesitated. Aren't we forgetting something? High above them, a forlorn voice wailed. Help! Get me down! Still snared in the dirty festooning webs, poor Tollichuk snivelled miserably. The smith turned and chuckled. Thimblegrave, he commanded, Fly up and be the sword. Cut away both web and cord. From its sheath, a little knife came shooting. Up into the branches it spun, cleaving a glittering arc. Into Frighty Aggie's clinging nets the knife went, slashing and hacking at incredible speed. And suddenly, Tollichook tumbled from the branches to land with a terrific bump. But he was too relieved to be out of the filthy cobwebs to yelp. Thimblegrave, the smith called, home! The knife rocketed from above and slid back into its sheath. If that's the last of your party, the smith said, we'd best get gone. And he strode into the hedge, leaving the others to hasten after. The wandering smith was camped only a short distance away, and presently they were warming themselves in the merry flames of his fire while he tended to Gamaliel's shoulder. Lafidia fed the fox cub some warm milk that the smith had given her, and the half-starved animal nuzzled lovingly against her, while Tollichuk gazed curiously at the smith's handcart. It was a rickety, much-battered contraption, but it was the contents that fascinated Tollichuk. There were iron pots, shapely ladles, a collection of swords, knives, goblets, metal helms, similar to the one the smith wore, a kettle whose spout was shaped like a leaping fish, Copper lanterns pierced with hundreds of tiny holes, a cowbell, plates of tin, a wooden chest containing a wealth of talismans and amulets like those he wore about his neck and had used upon Gamaliel. Over the side of the cart, a vast array of spoons hung upon a length of wire, yet in among that abundance, Tollichuk saw other things that he did not like the look of. Small bronze statues with fearsome faces, effigies, of ancient forest gods and fire devils. End of Side 2 Side 3 that's as much as the smith can do, the stranger said, applying a poultice to Gamaliel's shoulder. Only time will decree if he lives or dies. The whirlings looked at Gamaliel, but it seemed to them that already the deathly pallor had left his face. Lafidia thanked him warmly. We're always told not to have any dealings with big folk, she said. I don't know why. Are they all as kind as you? He merely laughed in reply and began examining Finnan's injury. "'Are you from the Hollow Hill?' she asked. 
A frown clouded the smith's face, but he said nothing. Placing Finnan's arm in a sling, the smith settled himself before the fire and hung a large, covered pot over the flames. Root stew, the smith said briefly. And when it was hot, doled the bubbling food onto the smallest plates he could find in his cart. The children ate hungrily. The smith had forgotten about the little changes who live on the border of the forest, the stranger murmured to himself. Maybe he's not the only one. Would you risk it, Smith? Should you risk it? Well, my jolly friends, he said brightly, what sport were you playing with the Warden of the Holly? Lucky that the Smith heard your hullabalooing. This side of the stream is no place for your kind to be adventuring. Finnan explained what had led them there, and when the tale was complete, the Smith fingered his beard. Not like the were hag to leave her prey like that, he muttered. What was it about you? She found not to her taste. The boy lowered his gaze. Hmm. Soon as you've rested, and the hours have judged what will befall your stung companion, the smith will guide you home. But heed his warning. Never set foot inside the wild forest again. Oh, that I won't, Tollichuk declared emphatically. Keep to your own trees, the smith continued. Ages have you spent hiding from sight, ignored and overlooked. Let that way endure. Trust no one. Shun those not of your race. Even folk like you? Lafidia asked. There are no others like Smith, he told her sharply. Oh, not no more. Not hereabouts. No pookers. Most important of all, have no dealings with those who dwell in the hollow hill. If you value your lives and those that you love. We never see the likes of them. Tollichuk chirped, happily stroking his full tummy, but I never heard nought bad against him. I don't think the hill men even know we exist, Finnan added. The smith snorted. Were rats, he proclaimed. That was their name for you, in days long gone. Whether they still recall you, Smith was just wondering that himself. You do come from the hollow hill, don't you? Lafidia said shrewdly. Once, he replied. Many springs ago, when the forest was called Dunrake, and the crown graced the brow of a king. What happened to make you leave? Finnan asked. Ain't no pretty story, he said. A black history, full of spite and malice. You'll not sleep the easier for the hearing and shadows will seem darker when it's done. Be very sure before you open your ears. The whirlings looked uncertain. Perhaps it was too great a burden for them after all. They were only a small, insignificant people, no match for the enemy. Shall Smith tell it, or no? he asked. And again he spoke more to himself than the others. Yes, please! An unexpected voice cried. The whirlings whipped around and broke into astonished laughter. There, sitting up, the colour already back in his cheeks, was Gamaliel Tumpin. Dark rings circled his eyes and he looked a trifle groggy, but otherwise he was back to his old self and eager for a story of the hill folk. The pooka regarded him and the others afresh. This little people were more hardy than he had surmised. And so, finally, he made his decision. So be it, he began. Know then the saga of tears, and how the tyrant ascended the throne. Once, in carefree times, in the reign of Ragalach, king of the summer country beneath the hollow hill, the smith worked in the royal forge. Eight other pukas of greater skill than his own laboured there also to shoe the royal steeds with silver and fashion bright armour for the goblin knights was their chief toil, and their work had no rival. Yet other things they made, toys for the royal children, the princesses Morthana and Clarissant, and the young prince Alessander. 
The children grow, and the toys grew also. For Prince Alexander, the Pookas fashioned the most lovely of all their works, a gold and silver dagger whose haft was carved from shimmering crystal. But the mood within the court altered. The Lady Morthana had flowered into the fairest maiden ever to grace the hidden kingdom. She yearned for power. But Alexander was the heir, not she. And when a suitor came to woo her, his heart turned instead to Clarissant. Morthana hatched a terrible vengeance. But the lovers disappeared, and no one ever discovered what befell them. The realm of King Ragalach became a solemn and mournful place, devoid of song and merriment, and the Lady Morthana's whispered lies turned friend against friend, and the nobles were set at odds and divided, until the mood soured to the correct degree for Morthana's designs. Upon that dark day, she came to the forge, charging the nine pookas to create a small golden casket with an enchanted lock that could only ever be opened by one key and one alone. A gift to her father, she claimed. And so that no word of its making should reach his ears, the smiths were sworn to secrecy. Loving their lord, the pookas poured all their skill into the building of the glittering box, and when it was completed, Morthana seized it greedily. The smith paused, and his eyes sparkled and were wet. What happened? Lefidia asked. Black deeds. That very night, King Ragalach and his guards were slain, and the instrument of their murder was the Prince Alexander's dagger. The air was taken, and so treacherous was the mood that none heeded his pleas of innocence. The prince contrived his escape, but was hunted by the Redcaps and Spriggans. Over the heathland, Alessander fled to reach the lonely mere, for his pursuers despised the touch of water. Yet, even as he leapt from the shore, an arrow plunged into his back, and he sank, lifeless, into the cold deeps. So did Morthana succeed the throne, and she took to herself the name Rhiannon, High Queen. Many evils were committed in that accursed time. Because Alessandra's dagger had been forged in the royal smithy, Rhiannon decreed that Ragalach's blood stained the hands of its makers also. To the forge the wild redcaps went, and over their own anvils the pukas were cruelly put to death. Their hands were chopped from their wrists, and their heads hacked from their necks. Yet only eight did they slay. The ninth they could not, and never did, find. Awestruck, the whirlings stared at him. Why have you come back? Finnan asked. A sombre smile split the pooka's greying beard. Smith has a task left undone, he said. Of all the folk in that summer land beneath the turf, he alone doubted the fair mask of the eldest princess. When the suitor came, it was Smith who warned him against her. Then, when the casket of gold was made and she bore it away, Smith followed her. Down a steeply winding stair she ran to the deepest and most secure of her father's strong rooms. Stout and barred was the door and Smith could not presume to know what she did therein, yet her voice rang faint through the timbers, and his beard curled to hear the dreadful spells it recited. Smith shrank into the shadows, and at last the door swung open, and out she strode. Taking the great key that hung from her waist, she locked the strong room behind her, and clasped in her hands the prince's dagger that she had stolen that day. Then, with murder on her mind, she ran up the stair and headed straight for her father's bedchamber. Putting his mouth to the strong-room lock, the smith spoke a charm that sprang the hasp aside and into the chamber he stole. It was vast and empty, save for a circle of stones at its centre, and there, upon the floor, was the golden casket and its key. 
Smith looked within and howled in revolt. In that moment, he should have showed his metal and done the one deed that would have saved them all, but his stomach rebelled and he could not. Instead, he took the casket and fled from the hill. As he ran into the trees, he heard the horn sounding, announcing the death of the king, but alas, the smith thought that they pronounced his own doom. In blind panic, he concealed the golden box and went not into the forest again. When he uncovered the truth, it was too late. A tyrant, Rhiannon is now, and all her subjects fear her. Yet though she has gained all her desires, not once throughout these long years has she been able to enjoy her reign. Until the casket is found, and in her keeping not an instant's peace or rest shall she have. What was in the box? Gamaliel begged. The puka's voice sank to a chilling whisper. Within that casket lies the only hope of destroying the cruel monarch of the Hollow Hill. It alone can bring an end to her immortal life, and that is why, waking and sleeping, Rhiannon is fearful. For inside the box, pulsing and beating by loathsome craft, is Rhiannon's very own heart. The whirlings shivered in spite of the campfire's flames. High above, in the topmost branches of the tree that leant over their heads, a large barn owl blinked its golden eyes, then spread its wings. Into the night it flew. What was that? the puka said, staring about them. Smith felt eyes upon him. Aye, and ears too. Rising, he doused the fire and kicked the drowned ashes. Come, little changers, he announced. You must return to your own safer land. Quickly, he packed the handcart and took Gamaliel and the fox cub in his arms. Soonest you are back in your trees, Smith will be happy, he said, striding from the camp. There is much to do this night. The casket must be removed from the hiding place, and then Smith will finish this business by doing what he should have done down in the strong room. Come dawn... Hagwood will be free of the High Lady's tyranny. Hasten, little friends. The night is not yet ended. There may still be many dangers ahead for us all. Upon the barren heath, Mufus and Bufus were enjoying themselves immensely. Wurgling into mice, they charged through the coarse grasses that covered the heath, revelling in the freedom of that vast, deserted space. Finally... They threw themselves into the long grass where their clothes were heaped in an untidy pile and stared up at the stars, exhausted and content. Wish it was like this all the time, Mufus sighed, snapping a grass stem and nibbling it. All the same, we really should find a hedgehog of our own. I don't feel like it, his brother moaned. Well, if we don't, you know what will happen. They'll all end up being able to wurgle into one before we do. Can't have that, can we? Bufus conceded that he had a point. Mind you, I haven't seen a hedgehog the whole time we've been here, have you? No, Mufus replied with a scowl. Come to think of it, I haven't seen any living thing at all. Cocking his head to one side, he waggled his mousy ears, but could hear nothing. No sound anywhere. Nothing but the wind a rustling them bushes down there. Look. I'd best go and see if I can round up one of those prickly cowards. Must all be skulking in them thorn clumps. He wurgled back into his usual self and pulled on his breeches. Watch out, eh, jogs. Mufus Doolin is coming to get you. Cackling like a little demon, he marched through the coarse grasses, down to where the thorns obscured the shores of the lonely mere. You can't hide from me! he called in his spookiest voice. There's no escape. Your doom is nigh. To the very edge of the thorns he went. The twigs shook and Mufus straightened. Something peculiar was happening. 
Gazing up at the quivering branches, he suddenly realised that the wind was not strong enough to make them bow and bend like that. Mufus began to grow uneasy. Then Mufus thought he heard a malevolent, rasping voice hiss behind him. Come, come to dark, snag at once. The whirling whisked around. Who's that? he demanded. The twigs rattled all the more, and Mufus became afraid. Mufus! he shouted in alarm. Black shapes were moving in those tangled depths, and the whirling took a frightened step backwards. At once a pair of pale eyes snapped open in the murk. Mufus wailed for his brother, and then, to his horror, the thorn bush he was standing by reared upward. From the grass the ogre rose, its buckled legs creaking. In the gnarled head the mouth split open, and twisted arms came swinging round, the fingers of deformed claws jerking and writhing as they reached out to snatch him. Bufus! Mufus Doolan screamed for the last time, and then his voice was silenced forever. Shrill cries had disturbed Bufus' slumber, and with a reluctant groan he opened one eye. The night had become deathly silent once more. Mufus, he said. A fuzzy recollection of their last conversation came back to him, and he stared across the heath to where the thorn bushes grew. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he shouted Mufus's name. But there was still no response. Mm, what's she doing down there? he muttered. I'm bored of this and want to go home now. Sweeping his tail behind him, Bufus wandered over the scrubland, pressing ever closer to the eclipsing mass of thorn and briar. Did you find any? he called. Did you pull a handful out for me? You'd better, or else... Drawing near to the bushes, Bufus thought he heard thin laughter, and he toddled a little faster towards them. What are you chuckling at in there? he asked. Bufus? Where are you? The mouse halted. The laughter had stopped, and he wavered uncertainly. It wasn't like his brother to play games like this with him. Thorny branches filled his vision. Then, something in the corner of his eye made him turn and glance upward. Bufus Doolan choked back a cry. Above him, impaled upon the spiky twigs, hung Mufus' lifeless body. The branches rattled, and croaking laughter floated from the shadows. Howling, Bufus turned tail and ran for his life. When they finally crossed the Hagburn and stepped back into their own land, Finnan and the others breathed great, glad gulps of the air. This was where they belonged here in this pleasant corner of Hagwood, where the trees were tall and beautiful, and all was safe and familiar. It was when they arrived at the Tumpin home that they discovered that evil had already entered in. Worried that their son's party had not returned when the other groups had been recalled upon Bufus' arrival home, Figgle and Tidubel were keeping watch in the branches. As the smith strode over the woodland floor, they saw Gamaliel sitting in the crook of his arm and rushed down the tree as fast as they were able. Nuts and pips, Fickle cried, overjoyed, but regarding the pooka shyly. Where have you been? Oh, we were so worried, Mrs. Tumpin declared. Oh, what a terror this night has been. The smith set Gamaliel upon the ground next to them. But when they embraced their son, he flinched, and his hand flew to his shoulder. You're hurt, they cried. Rest is all he requires. The smith assured them. Finnan explained that it was the Pooka who had saved Gamaliel's life. But where's Canella? Gamaliel asked. Figgle's tail drooped. She's gone with the rest, Figgle told them, to the Silent Grove, to attend the Edtermen. It's Mufus Doolan. He's been killed. Bufus came home with a tale of him impaled high in dense thorn bushes, but when we went to recover his body, there was not a thorn to be seen, and Mufus lay bloodless 
on the grass of the heathland. At the southernmost tip of the Whirling's territory, the ground dipped into a shallow but wide dingle. Within this broad hollow, many ancient beech trees grew, and beneath their spreading branches, a sombre silence lay. This was the silent grove, a region of gentle calm and serenity, where those they had loved were finally laid to rest and given back to the forest. This was the Whirling burial ground. Gamaliel was sent straight to bed. The others, however, set off immediately for the grove, and, still carrying the fox cub, for they could not leave it behind, the wandering smith accompanied them. Beneath the trees, the whirlings sorrowfully paraded. The profound sadness of their lament blended exquisitely with the stark beauty of the dappling moonlight, and the puka hung back, removing the helm from his head. Smith will not intrude on such a hour as this, he explained. The rights of your folk should not be overlooked by any other. Tollichuk glanced at Lafidia and Finnan. We should go in, he said. Lafidia agreed, but Finnan resisted. He couldn't bring himself to look on the anguish of Mufus's family. It wasn't your fault, Lafidia insisted. We'd all be dead if it wasn't for you. You saved us from Frighty Aggie. If it wasn't for me, we wouldn't have gone to her lair in the first place, Finnan answered. There was nothing Lafidia could say to ease his conscience. With Torichuk bumbling alongside, she pattered down the bank. The puka turned to the whirling boy. Regret and guilt, he began gruffly. Tie you up tight as the Werhag's webs they will. Don't you reproach yourself over things outside your control. The foul servants of Rhiannon committed this awful murder. Vile things they are. Malignant horrors spawned in the blackness of her thought. Finnan found no comfort in his words, and the unlikely pair sat at the edge of the silent grove, locked in their own private brooding. At last... The puka said, Never has Smith seen beaches like them yonder. What malady afflicts them so? The trees of the silent grove were distorted in shape. Every trunk was covered in unnatural bulges and crusty swellings. Up into the high sturdy boughs the tumorous growths reached. They're not diseased, Finnan revealed. It's us. Those are our grave markers. Hurrying in the wake of the trailing procession, Tollichuk and Lafidia tagged themselves on to the end of the mourners. Presently they halted by one of the gibbous beaches, and the whirlings congregated around it. Arms outstretched, Master Gibble stepped forward, and in a loud, imploring voice called, Blessed Beach, Mother of the Forest you are, here we have brought to you one of your sons. Receive and keep him, we beg. Slender ropes were tied to each of the beer's four corners, and Master Gibble clambered up the tree composed and dignified. Two stout and strong whirlings, bearing the four ropes, followed him and ascended even higher, throwing the lines over sturdy branches above their heads. When they were in position, Master Gibble gave the sign, and they began to heave on the cables. The Wurgelmaster spread his tapering fingers over moderate undulations in the beech tree and pressed his lips to the bark. Then, in a low, worshipful voice, recited, Beech, beech, blessed beech, within your timbers our long past slumbers. Great is that list of those we have missed, but open and keep another who sleeps. Take him now away from reach. The mourners at the base of the tree joined their hands and closed their eyes. Almost imperceptibly, they began to hum, one long, protracted note, and in response, the branches of the tree shivered and swayed. From the bottommost roots, a slow tremor rippled up the trunk, flowing up into the branches in a spiralling wave, surging just below the knobbed surface. Upon the quivering branches, tiny buds burst forth, 
blossoming with purple, tassel-like flowers that danced and trembled. Their rustling was like a whispering music that made a fragile harmony with the humming of the whirlings. In the heart of every bloom, a bright dew burned with a golden light, and the welling radiance streamed through the grove, dispelling the midnight gloom. The bark beneath Master Gibble's palms rolled and pulsed. Then, with his fingernail, he drew a line along the soft and mushing rind. Into the yielding wood the mark sank, becoming a furrow that deepened into a crack which became a cleft, creeping wider and wider apart until a great hole had opened up in that mighty bough. A delicate fragrance arose from the strange chasm, and the tutor's nostrils quivered. "'Raise him!' he called to the rope handlers. Over that newly gaping gulf the stretcher was heaved into position, and Master Gibble guided its course with his spindly fingers. "'Blessed beach!' he called aloud. "'You are the book in which our forebears are recorded.' Closely do you keep their names from first to last. Accept then another to guard and protect him in the mansion of the dead. Here is Mufus Doolan, outside our care now. Thus unto yours do we commend him. The ropes that tethered the stretcher by Mufus' feet were lowered gently, and the boy's body slid down into the waiting grave. Slowly the bark closed together, sealing Mufus within for as long as the tree should endure. The scintillating light grew dim, and the mysterious blossoms fell from the branches. The resonant humming faded to silence, and the tree ceased its trembling. "'It is done,' Master Gibble proclaimed. The ceremony was over, and the mourners began to disperse through the grove, pausing at certain trees. Some of the whirlings caressed the rugged projections, while others watered the ground with tears. "'The growths,' the smith said. "'Why are they so uneven in size?' "'It has to do with how strong the wurgling gift was in whoever lies there. The really big bumps show where a grand wurgle master is interred. It affects the wood somehow.' The Lufkin tree is over there. <laughs> the transforming skill must run mighty in your family, the pooker observed. Yon Lufkin tree seems fair to rupturing. But the night grows old, and Smith has the great matter to attend to. By morning the land may be cleansed, and there will be no more slaughter of children. Will you come back? Finnan asked. The pooker smiled grimly. On that... There's no doubt. Smith'll have to. Finnan wondered if there was more to those words than he could guess, for the pooka had looked at him strangely. The silent grove was deserted. The mourners had returned to their homes. All was quiet and hushed once again. Finnan glanced cautiously around him, then stepped down into the tranquil dingle. Purposefully, he strode towards the tree that housed the deceased members of the Lufkin family, and standing in its shadow, he lifted his face. It was wrung with remorse and shame. Forgive me, he whispered. Very slowly, because of the injury to his arm, he began to climb, and when he reached a cleft in the trunk, Finnan's ascent ceased. Two immense limbs, covered with vast swellings, mounted the night upon either side, and, turning to face a particularly large and warty protuberance, the boy bowed in respect. Mafti Lufkin, supreme Wurgelmaster, second only to Agnilla Helikin, pardon this wretch, your humble descendant. I was not blessed with your skill. Unclasping the leather bag at his belt, the very one that frighty Aggie had poured over. Finnan took out a tiny whittling knife. A shudder ran through his body, and his face contorted with self-loathing. But there was no going back. Raising the blade close to the lumpy growth that marked the resting place of his exalted forebear, he started shaving the bark away, and in the small bag 
he collected the pairings. Many years ago, Agnella Helikin had reaped a similar harvest. By chewing slivers of wood garnered from the grave markers of past Wurgelmasters, she had greatly increased her already formidable powers. Finnan had heard the tale from his grandmother, and when he failed at his first Wurgling attempt, he had foolishly dared to do the same. Weeping, he crawled down the beech tree and stumbled home. At the edge of the silent grove, a gangly figure stepped from the shadows where it had been hiding, and a spiteful sneer crept over its long-nosed face. My successor, indeed, Tersa Gibble spat. Approaching his encampment, the Pooka went straight to his handcart and drew out a gleaming sword. The tempered blade rang musically, but even before the note faded, the smith hissed under his breath. Something was horribly wrong. Whirling around, he dashed back the way he had come, the sword sweeping before him, but it was too late. He had entered the trap, and now it snapped shut. A ferocious clamour suddenly broke out, and the darkness was filled with raucous yells. From the encircling trees, evil shapes with small, shining eyes came springing, and crashing into the Pooka's path to prevent his escape, he saw three enormous thorn ogres. From every shadow the horrors charged, and their infernal shrieks trumpeted in the Pooka's ears. Devils of thorn and hate they were, snarling, screeching fiends. And over all their heads the barn owl circled, calling the commands of their pitiless mistress. Take him, it hooted. Seize the hated thief. There were too many for the smith to overcome, yet he would not be captured without dispatching as many of his foes as he was able. Thimbleglave, he cried, fly and fight, let your steel cut the night. From his belt the enchanted knife bolted, hurling itself at the raging enemy. Glittering like a cold splinter of moonlight, it plunged and stabbed. Grasping claws were sliced apart, eyes burning with malice were rapidly extinguished, and shrieking gullets were razored. Bellowing, the ogres fell before the blades slashing volleys, but for every slain monster there were countless others to take their place. The smith grasped the hilt of his sword and swung it into the woody necks of the fiends that leapt in front of him. For Angirion, he roared splitting a repulsive, spiny-crowned head in two. For Groma, Gwedno, Diamond, and Cormac! Three more ogres tumbled under the sword's lethal blows, and the smith sprang onto the hill of their bodies. For Bodach, and Hafgan, and Lonfal, he thundered. For all of my kindred whose blood she shed unjustly! Like one possessed, he battled. But long claws raked his skin. Others snatched at his hair and beard while the helm was not from his head. Then, clambering over the mound of its fallen comrades, the greatest of those nightmares came, grinning. Nagatash! Nagatash! The other ogres chanted. Trampling the dead, beneath its huge clubbed feet, the chieftain of the thorn ogres came. A strip of braided twigs banded its projecting forehead, and the eyes that glared at the beleaguered smith were dark windows into its hellish mind. Bracing himself for another assault, the smith lunged and the sword sang. Up onto its trunk-like legs, Nagatash reared, and a horrendous bawling shriek rumbled in its throat. Down sliced the sword, and the smith pushed all his flagging strength into the attack. There was a dazzling flash of sparks, and the blade bit into the apparition's hide. But the blow had been too fierce, and the thorny armour of Nagatash was bound about with troll witch spells. A juddering vibration travelled the length of the blade, and the sword shattered as though made of glass. With the broken tip still lodged in its shoulder, Nagatash laughed horribly, and the surrounding host shrieked their foul glee. Robbed of his sword... The defenceless Pooka saw the huge chieftain prowl towards him, and in the depths of those eyes he saw himself reflected, a puny, helpless figure staring at the advance of his own death. Hold him! 
the owl demanded from above. The ogre's grin leered even wider, and then it pounced. Only one chance remained, and the smith cried out at the top of his voice, Timbergrave! The enchanted knife came streaking through the air and plummeted straight into the furrows between the monster's eyes. A guttural gasp escaped Nagatash's jaws, and the massive legs crumpled beneath its great bulk. Down it smashed, and the malice behind those dark eyes perished. It was the Pooka's last victory. The besieging ogres screeched with rage at the loss of their chieftain and rushed to avenge him. Thimblegrave, the smith called, but the knife was embedded deep in the head of Nagatash, and the magic failed. The puka was powerless, and the ogres flung themselves upon him. Battered and bleeding, the smith was hurled into the air, then dashed to the ground. Enough! the barn owl screeched. He must not be slain! Not yet! Snarling, the ogres fell back, and the bird alighted upon one of the cart's buckled wheels. The gold of its eyes shone with gloating triumph. Little thief! The owl spoke with arch contempt. What of thy grand design now? Still my mistress lives, but thy tale hath nearly ended. Striped and crossed with bright scarlet cuts, the smith returned the bird's condemning stare. Go back to the hag who hatched you, he spat. The owl chuckled wickedly. Still thy manners are wanting, it said. I charge thee to yield that which thee did steal. Return that precious property unto its rightful owner. It was the pooka's turn to laugh. A bleak, piteous sound in that awful place. Little good would it do her, he scorned. Nay, only Smith could put that thing to any use. You will never learn its whereabouts from his lips. Shall I not? the owl retorted. Many are the devices in the dark dungeons of the cold hills, diverse instruments to gouge and draw. By the morrow the torture masters will have picked the lock of thy insolent tongue. Racked with fatigue and weakened by the stinging pains of his wounds, the puka was filled with dread. Under torment he might indeed divulge where the casket containing the high lady's heart was hidden, and he cursed himself. On to the mound of slaughtered ogres, Snaggart, a rat-like, thorny imp went bounding to get a better view as they carried him by. Reveling in the puka's distress, it capered madly, clapping its hands and gibbering. Pinch! Punch! it yapped. More squeals! More squeals! Snag it like! Snag it like! Stick it! Poke it! As it was prancing, the creature's squint eyes fell upon the smith's dagger, still lodged firmly in Nagatash's skull. It licked its lips covetously. Snag it! Want! Grasping the handle, the ogre tugged. Flapping with frustration, it planted one foot squarely on the dead chieftain's brow, then took hold once more and heaved. Snaggart! Have! It growled. The dagger twisted in the wound, and a trickle of Nagatash's blood oozed out. Snaggart! Take! came the straining shout. With that, the blade sprang from the monster's skull, and Snaggart somersaulted backwards. At once he scurried back to the top of the heap, flourishing the dripping blade as he danced a clumsy jig. Mine! Mine! he shrieked. The imp's crowing cries rose above all other noises, and the puka craned his head to look on that frolicking creature. Embers of hope burst into new flame within him, and a grim smile parted his beard. Thimble glaive, he murmured. Flying above him, the owl suddenly saw what Snaggart was brandishing and espied the puka staring at it intently. Cover his mouth! The bird squawked in alarm. Stifle his words! But it was already too late. 
trusty knife, trusty knife, the pooka had muttered. Fly to me and take my life. From Snagget's unsuspecting claws the dagger flew. Up it soared, scribing a bright, clear and graceful line in the air. Then down it came. A welcoming laugh was on the smith's lips as the enchanted knife dived swiftly into his breast. Fools! the owl screeched. Swooping from above, the bird plucked at the dagger with its feet, but there was nothing it could do. The pooka was dying. The smith rolled his eyes sideways, and a gently mocking smile drifted across his features. His last glimpse of the living world was of the night-clad trees nearby, where a slender figure stepped from the gloom, wrapped in a mantle of shimmering shadow. Achingly beautiful, the Lady Rhiannon was like a pinnacle of graven ice. No light sparkled in her large, loveless eyes, and she regarded the pooka with chill disdain. Murdering witch, he gasped. Well met, after... After all the parting years. Goffanon, the High Lady addressed him by his true name, and the edge in her voice was as keen and deadly as wetted steel. Redeem me yourself in these parting moments. Atone and repent your arch treason. A low chuckle rattled in the pooka's throat. Now shall you be safe, Rhiannon. A rigantona, he warned in a hoarse whisper. The box you do not and shall never have. Your own ending approaches with the far sight of those close to death. Smith sees it truly. A fire he has kindled. And in its heat, your doom is ready wrought. Your vile works will crumble, and you will burn in ruin. Smith goes with a glad heart, for he has denied you yours. The smile remained traced upon his lips, but the wandering Smith spoke no more. We are displeased, our provost, the Lady Rhiannon spoke to the owl. We have not bided his long absence to be hindered here at the last. Tear his paltry cart to pieces and examine his peasant belongings. If you find naught there, then scour every inch of this squalid woodland. The casket must be found. The owl bowed before her, and with a final maleficent look at the pooka's body, the high lady moved back into the dark. There was a flurry of fallen leaves and a chill wind blew through the forest. What of the thief, mistress? the bird inquired. Her voice came floating from the invisible and it was frozen with contempt. Let our pets search him to his very marrows. The first light of morning was grey and drear. In a deep burrow beneath the roots of a wild apple tree, the presiding council of the Whirlings met. Sitting upon a low bench against the wall, the Doolan family sat. Bufus stared at the floor, waiting to be called to give his account of what had occurred. But all that he wanted was to have his brother back. Across the chamber, Finnan, Lafidia and Tollichuk sat. It had been decided that Gamaliel's testimony could wait until later in the day because of the injury to his shoulder. That, and the fact that his mother stubbornly refused to waken him at that early hour. Taking up a small ceremonial hammer, a wrinkled whirling called Diffie Maffin pronounced the meeting open. Great is the sadness that hangs over our land this day, Yuri Mattock stated. A child has been killed while out on the important business of instruction. 
The exact circumstances must be investigated and established so that no such incident will ever befall us again. Let the first witness approach the council, Irvin Goylock called. Lefidia Neffin, step forward. Lefidia obeyed and gave a true account of how the Doolans had disappeared and everything that happened afterwards. The expressions of the council members dissolved from portraits of dignified sobriety to caricatured masks of amazement. Finally, when they heard how Finnan had fought Frighty Aggie, one of the elders, Benwyn Ortle, slapped the table to interrupt her. Stop, girl, he demanded. What nonsense is this? How dare you mock us with your lies? I'm not lying, she retorted. That's just what happened. Well, how can you not believe me? The six councillors spoke amongst themselves, and Tersa Gibble uttered something in a whisper. Mr. Mattock addressed Lafidia again. Is it true, he began, that you find the furbishment of Wurgle pouches to be cruel, and that you had never believed in Frighty Aggie before you began instruction? Did you not, in fact, wish to wurgle into an insect? Yes, but I don't see what that has to... Stand down, Irvin told her. You're an unreliable witness. Tolly Chook, humble napper, come forth. Flushed and angry, Lafidia returned to her seat and Tolly Chook bashfully went to stand in her place. It was um, Doolan's fault, he burbled. Well, how were they to blame? Of course, they scarpered and left us. They went into the wild forest, and you followed them. Is that it? Yes. Or leastways, no. They didn't actually go that way, but, but Finnan thought they had. Diffy Maffin frowned. And is that where you met the outsider? she asked. Why did you consort with him and bring him to the interment? Tollychook sniffed unhappily. He saved us, he said. Well, Lefidia Neffin has told us that it was Finnan who saved you. <laughs> the story changes at every turn. Oh, he, he did, Tollychook cried. Th then both did. <laughs> then old Smith... He give us a root stew. <laughs> nice it were. The councillors blinked at him. Uh, are we to understand, Yuri Mattock said, incredulous, that while Mufus Doolan was being murdered, you were not even searching for him, but enjoying a hearty supper? Tollychook's face rumpled, and he began to cry. Sit down, Yuri commanded. Next, it was the turn of Bufus Doolan, and the council regarded him kindly. Uh, in your own time, Mr. Matter prompted in a sympathetic voice. Why did you go to the heath? Bufus cast a sidelong glance at Finnan and the others before speaking. Oh, Mufus, Mufus and me, we, we just went. And I know we shouldn't have, but we... Couldn't help it. Did you see what happened to your brother? Who or what committed this fiendish crime? Bufus shook his head wretchedly. Why did you not tell anyone where you and Mufus were headed? Irvin asked. The boy lifted his tear-stained face. Why, well, we did. Or well, Lufkin knew we wanted to go to the heath. We'd said so. Oh, he should have come fetched us, but he didn't. He was supposed to. We didn't. No, no better. The eyes of the councillors fell upon Finn and Lufkin, and Bufus's father spluttered, It's his fault! His fault! My son's dead! Diffie Maffin called for order to be restored, and when a brittle calm had settled, Irvin Goylock called, Finn and Lufkin! Step up! The hero of the Whirling Children stood before them. Lacing his spindly fingers together, Tersa Gibble 
eyed him coldly. Is it uh, true? Ben Wynne Ortel asked. Did the uh, Doolan twins tell you they wanted to go to the heath? They did. Lafidia called out. But they wanted to see the holly fence as well. We all thought that's where they were headed, not just Finnan. Yuri Matuk took up the questioning. Do you also admit that you purposely wasted precious time with an unknown vagrant? Finnan stared at Mr. Mattock. We weren't wasting time. The wandering smith told us of the High Lady and the Hollow Hill. What have they to do with us? Mistress Maffin exclaimed. Everything, Finnan replied, his temper simmering. There's something big going on out there. It was the servants of the Lady Rhiannon who killed Mufus. The smith is the only one who can save us. If he fails, then there'll be more murders and nowhere we'll be safe. We ought to be out there helping him. Silence! Yuri shouted. It is now plain to see where the impressionable minds in your charge learn their prattling falsehoods. How dare you utter such wicked lies about the royal folk of the hill? You are nothing but a, a lying coward. <laughs> Is it any wonder the Doolan children desired their own company away from you? Master Gibble, Yuri entreated, I look to you for guidance. It is evident that the blame of this tragedy lies with the Lufkin lad. What course shall we take? As for the Nethin girl, the tutor remarked, she suffers from lack of discipline and needs to feel the rod against her back that will curb her pert impudence and ensure her loyalty does not get misplaced again. And Tolly Chook Umble Napper is too clod stupid to know any better and has merely fallen in with the wrong company. Master Gibble licked his mottled teeth and considered Finnan with the utmost distaste. For you see, there has flourished in our midst a most hideous criminal, an assassin of all that we cherish and hold dear, a most heinous and obdurate poltroon, a mucid abscess that must be cut from our bodies. Behold the vile dissembler. See what foulness he has been perpetrating. The tutor's hand snatched a small leather bag from Finnan's belt and emptied the contents onto the floor. Out fell the chippings Finnan had taken from the silent grove, and uttering a dismal groan, the boy closed his eyes. His horrible secret was out. <laughs> End of side three. Side four. Gamaliel Tumpin awoke at noon. His dreams had been dark and troubled, but the sleep had refreshed him and now he felt ready for the day. Everything the smith had told them was still bright and terrible in his memory, and he looked around for his clothes so that he could go and discuss it with the others. In just a few minutes, he was hopping up the passage, pulling his shoes on, when he heard a sound that made him falter. It was coming from Canella's room. She was crying, puzzled, for he didn't realize that his sister had been especially fond of Mufus Doolan. He ventured to her doorway and peeped inside. With her face in her hands, Canella sat on a stool, weeping and sniveling. Gamaliel had never seen her so upset. It's Finnan, Canella wailed. He lied to me. He lied to everyone. He weren't no better at wurgling than the rest of us. He weren't cleverer or gifted at all. 
<laughs> he was going to the silent grove and stealing slivers of wood from the trees to increase his wurgle powers. Oh, Gamaliel, he was chewing and eating them. It's so disgusting. How could he? Gamaliel drew back, aghast. No, it can't be true. Finnan wouldn't do anything like that. But he did, she blubbed. Master Gibble saw him. Finnan's crime appalled Gamaliel. But the longer he thought about it, the more he understood the reason. If anyone knew about the pressures of wurgling instruction, Gamaliel did. Had he known about the powers that the Wood of the Silent Grove possessed, would he have resisted the temptation? He was not certain. You don't hate Finnan, really, he told his sister. Canella sniffed. <laughs> don't matter if I hate him or not. When they heard what he'd done, the council sentenced him to exile. Finnan's been banished, <laughs> sent over to Hagburn. I'll never see Finn and Lufkin again. Gamaliel could hardly believe what she was saying. Why didn't you wake me? Why didn't you tell me? I should have been there. I could have done something. Anger boiled. I won't have it, he shouted. Finn and saved all our lives last night. I don't care what else he's done. I'm not letting him go off without so much as a word of thanks. I'm going after him. He's got to know that I'm still his friend. Canella leapt from the stool and scurried after him. But you can't, she yelled. Gamaliel was already climbing down the oak when she reached the entrance and popped her head outside. It's forbidden, she called down to him. No one's permitted even to talk to Finn and now. Do you hear me? It's the law! Leaping onto the ground far below, her brother glanced up at her and shouted, Nuts and pips to the law! Close to the oak in which the Tumpins lived, a magnificent witch elm provided dwellings for five other whirling families, including the Doolans. Sitting high in the branches, Bufus was gazing into space, thinking of his late brother. When Gamaliel came storming down the nearby oak, the Doolan boy heard Canella's warning and ground his teeth together. As well as the members of the council, he had managed to convince himself that Finnan was responsible for Moose's death. The sight of Gamaliel marching off to go and speak to the despicable criminal was more than he could stand. No, you don't, Gammy, Boofus spat as he scrambled from his perch. Gibble's going to know about this. He'll stop you. Finn and Lufkin picked his way through the dense forest, trying his best not to think about what had happened that morning. He was trying to find the route that the wandering smith had taken when he returned the whirlings to their homes. The smith would most certainly have moved on, but the boy had nowhere else to go. Pressing further into that wild realm, the land began to rise steadily, and he found that he had strayed onto the lower slopes of a hill that rose above the encompassing trees. It was crowned by a single chestnut tree. Finnan thought it would be an excellent vantage point from which to survey the land. Struggling through the thick weeds, he climbed to the summit and, standing on tiptoe, viewed the forest roof. The vastness of Hagwood stretched in all directions. Glancing back westward, he saw how far he had already marched, but it was too painful for Finnan to look on the familiar oaks of that land he had been forbidden ever to set foot in again and so he bent his gaze south. A sheer green wall reared up in the distance, denying any intrusion from the mobbing forest. It was the holly fence. Finnan grimaced. There was no way he would approach that foul place again. But the smith's camp had lain upon the far side of Frighty Aggie's gruesome abode, so he would be forced to circle around it. The eastern edge of Hagwood was obscured beneath a blanket of pale mist, but he thought he could discern the faint shape of some remote tower revealed in the drifting vapour. Turning again, Finnan cast his eyes briefly to the north, where the huge green hump of the hollow hill dominated the skyline. Was the Lady Rhiannon lying dead within its halls? Surely there would be some outward sign. A gang of crows 
croaked in the slate-grey sky, and the boy suddenly felt alone and observed. He had seen enough. Threading his way back down his own humbler hill, he resumed his journey. But he had not gone very far when he became aware of a great disturbance ahead. There was a din of many trampling feet crashing through the dead, stalky undergrowth, and coarse voices were braying and yelling at one another, and the creators of the noise were heading his way. Then, through the crooked hornbeams ahead, he saw two grotesque, briar-crested creatures lumber into sight, and knew that they could only be servants of the High Lady. Finnan had never seen anything like the Thorn Ogres before, but he guessed that those monsters were responsible for Moofs's murder. Barging their way between the trees, their odious faces were cast to the ground. With their branching arms, they parted the dead bracken and tore up turf, constantly searching and hunting. Seek and find it, they chanted. Understand! Deep in hole, seek and find it. Choke a stick, crack whip. A different shrill voice came calling from the forest behind them. Wait by, wait by, snag it, join, snag it, join. Scuttling beneath their spiky bodies, the rat-sized imp pattered forward, waving in its claws the beautiful weapon that was the envy of the others. Finnan was too far away to recognise Thimbleglaive. Snaggart had ripped the enchanted knife from the pooka's body and claimed the blade as his own. Choke a stick, hate seek, one of the larger ogres growled. Not find treasure. Choke a stick, need fight, not seek. The other rattled its branches in agreement. Prize not here, it snarled. Arned not have, not in wagon, not on him, not in bones. Crack whip, he want blood kill. All want blood kill, Snaggart snapped back. Which mother say go look, must be, so Snaggart do, but Snaggart not want. A terrible realisation dawned upon Finnan as he listened to the Thorn Ogre's horrible talk. The wandering smith was dead. And the casket containing the heart of the Lady Rhiannon was still out there somewhere, and the tyrant of the hollow hill would stop at nothing to retrieve it. The whirling looked up at those horrors of thorn. More of the monsters were foraging in the distance, and a new fear gripped him. She must think the box is here, he breathed. What if she discovers that the smith went over the Hagburn with us last night? She'll send these nightmares across. Nobody will stand a chance against them. Silently, Finnan began hurrying back down his own trail. He had to return. He had to warn them. He had only run a little distance when he rounded a patch of dead ferns and blundered into Gamaliel. Finnan gaped at him, but there was no time for greetings or explanations. Hurrying from the undergrowth, he said in an urgent whisper, Don't speak too loudly. There are enemies back there. We've got to get back and alert everyone. Enemies? Gamaliel mouthed, and they both turned to run. Gamaliel Tumpin? A stern voice yelled. How dare you disobey the council's most solemn decree? Tersa Gibble. As soon as Bufus Doolan had told him of Gamaliel's intent, the outraged tutor had stormed off in pursuit. Now he stood before them, glowering down his enormous nose. Finnan glanced back nervously. Master Gibble's shouts were resounding beneath the branches, and he was certain the thorn ogres would hear him. Quiet! he hissed. The tutor stretched himself to his full, indignant height, and he yelled even louder. You have the audacity, he squawked, to order me to be silent. You, I am Tessa Gibble, the great grand wurgle master. What are you? Nothing. The dirt between my toes has more honour and worth than you. Whatever you say. Finnan uttered fearfully, just as long as you shut up. But the harm had been done. Just as Master Gibble drew breath, inflating himself to give vent to more scathing bile, a tremendous crashing thundered through the trees. Run! Finnan cried. Tursa Gibble flicked his head left and right as they dodged around him. 
Well, come, come back here, he commanded. What is? Then he saw them, the thorn ogres. Shrieking ferociously, they lurched into view, and the tutor gave a strangled squeal of terror. Blood kill! Choker stick boomed. Bite! Rend! Snag it, catch! Snag it, snap! The imp crowed, trying to squeeze between them. Master Gibble was too stricken with horror to move. Every eluding tactic and escaping manoeuvre froze in his brain, and his own teachings and strategies were completely forgotten. Crackwhip clapped its claws about the twitching tutor and lifted him to its widening jaws. No! Master Gibble screamed, thrashing his arms before the monster's repulsive face. Help! Save me! Save me! Pelting up the trail, Gamaliel and Finnan heard his cries. Skidding to a stop, they turned and beheld the Wurgle Master's deadly plight. Crackwhip's mouth was as wide as it could stretch, and Tursa Gibble's long nose was already halfway inside when suddenly Chokerstick yanked his captor's arm and the tutor was pulled into the air again. You not have, Chokerstick protested. Crack whip, drink much unhead blood. Give sweet meat to choke a stick. Ducking beneath them and licking its own fangs when it viewed Master Gibble, Snaggart hopped and skipped before their faces. No bite, no eat, the imp yapped. Not yet, not yet. Hear it squeal, hear it squeal. Must be asked, must be asked. Owl will want. Yes, it will. It say, bring any with speech. Crack whip must take, or which mother will know? Yeah, she blast crack whip, choker stick cackled. Scorch and flame, crack whip, burn! The ogre shuddered, and his branches clattered together in dread. Then, staring at the whirling in its clutches, it grunted, Blood kill wait, let owl ask, then crack whip bite. With Master Gibble, Still whining and begging for mercy, the thorn ogres turned about and headed back through the trees. Spare me, the tutor pleaded. Spare me, please. Where are they taking him? Canella's brother asked. What were those horrible things? Finnan shook his head. I don't know, but I have to save him if I can. You go back and tell the others. I'll follow these horrors and wait for a chance. No, you don't, Finn and Lufkin, Gamaliel refused. You're going nowhere on your own. I'm coming with you. Finnan could tell that it was pointless trying to argue, and so, as quickly as they dared, the whirlings chased after the thorn ogres and pushed deeper into the forest. Snaggart, Crackwhip and Chokerstick could move swiftly on their misshapen legs. Through the hornbeams, tortured elms and malformed sycamores, they stamped and stumped, while the other thorn ogres they encountered fell in behind, laughing at the terrified notes sounding from the puny creature they had caught, until, finally, they came to where the smith had made his encampment. A terrible violence had been visited upon that small space. Trees were thrown down, their roots unearthed and exposed. The trunks were hacked and torn apart. Deep pits and trenches had been gouged in the soil, and more were being dug. Not a blade of grass was left standing or unbroken, and even the stones were cracked like eggs. To this desolation the thorn ogres came, barging, pouring over the splintered trees to gather around the brinks of the newly grubbed pits, eager to see what the messenger of the High Lady would make of the unusual creature in Crack Whip's claws. Destruction on such a scale was outside the experience or knowledge of any whirling. Finnan's throat went dry when he thought about a calamity of equal force striking in the heart of their home beyond the Hagburn. Finnan saw that one of the uprooted trees was leaning directly over that hideous multitude. Murmuring his plan to Gamaliel, they sneaked across the shattered ground and climbed nimbly up the ravaged trunk, then peered down. In the centre of that malevolent crew, a large barn owl was perched upon a pile of twisted metal the mangled remains of the wandering smith's wares. The owl blinked its golden eyes and stared at the quivering tutor contemptuously. Have pity, 
Master Gibble squealed. Don't kill me! Please! Why do ye bring this paltry runt before me? The owl demanded. It spoke! The whirling cried in wild consternation. The bird flexed its talons. "'Tis naught but a were-rat, it remarked. A base creation of no import. Yet Goffinon, the arch-traitor, did speak with four of these puny creatures this end of night ere he perished. Could it be that my lady's servants hath hunted in the wrong places for that thing he stole? The golden eyes closed, and the bird sang quietly under its breath. Mistress of the twilight, it intoned, hear the supplication of thy humble provost. Far away, in the deep caverns beneath the hollow hill, the Lady Rhiannon took up a silver mask, fashioned and graven into the shape of an owl's face, and placed it before her own ravishing countenance. Upon the wreckage of the smith's wares, a purling sigh floated from the owl's beak, and the icy draught was like the very breath of winter. "'Where is this one you would have us behold?' the bird said. But the voice that spoke was not its own, and when the eyes opened, bright silver shone where previously only gold had burned. "'Which mother?' the ogres groaned, cowering and fawning on the ground. An argent gleam flickered over their thorny features, and they cringed and hid their horrendous faces. Finally, the cold light fell upon Tersa Gibble, and the spindly whirling stammered and wept. "'Low-bred beast!' came the bitter voice of the Lady Rhiannon. "'Hear the dictate of your queen, and obey us without question.' Master Gibble wagged his head, trilling incessantly through his nose. "'Anything!' he swore. The pale light flared. "'Where is the casket that was stolen? "'To what secret place did Goffinon the smith bear it? "'Where is it bestowed? You will tell us. You must answer.' "'Casket?' The tutor stuttered. I, I don't, I don't know of any, uh, of any, I just... The were-rat knows nothing, the voice scorned. You waste our time, provost. Destroy this puling creature, feed him to our pets. No! Master Gibble shrieked. I think, yes, I do know one who would know. He was in the smith's company longer than any, and, and many words they exchanged. If any might know where this thing you so justly want return may be, it's him, Finnan Lufkin. Watching in the tree above, Finnan stared down at the wretched Tursa Gibble, bewildered and afraid. He's the one, Master Gibble gabbled on. It's the truth, I promise. How can I prove it to you? How? A dark glimmer of his own entered the tormented tutor's beady eyes, and a fey laugh giggled from his mouth. Ah, I know, he crowed. Send your fiendish pets over the Hagburn, my most honoured lady. They will be met by the doughty forces of my people, who will resist with every trick they know, everything I have taught them. But spare my life, and my folk can be defeated. And captured. The treasure you seek will be won more swiftly. The wintry light glimmered over the whirling's face. Dearly do you buy your spineless life, yet if this is true, then you have earned your freedom of us. Master Gibble snivelled his gratitude. Then the most respected and revered member of the whirling race committed the most despicable and loathsome sin in the long history of their kind. He told them the words of power, the secret unlocking passwords. Aghast, Finnan shuddered. We have to get back, he whispered. We haven't a moment to lose. Pleased with his craven cunning, Master Gibble instructed the servants of the High Lady until the ancient words were learnt. "'None shall withstand them,' he said proudly. Mm, "'You said I could go free.' The silver eyes gleamed at him. 
And so you may, the voice promised. The owl turned its head to crack whip, ordering the monster to let the were-rat loose. The bird's beak opened once more. Verily, you must turn him loose, but not until you have separated the base creature from his irritating nose. Cut it off. With the agonised screams of Master Gibble ringing in their ears, Gamaliel and Finnan scurried down the trunk and ran for their lives. But as they sped, one of the thorn ogres chanced to turn, and it saw them flee. Spies! it croaked. See! Spies! Shrieking and screeching, the evil host charged forth. Hideous shouts blared beneath the trees, and the forest streaked past Gamaliel and Finnan as a tangled blur. Away from the mutilation of the smith's encampment, they pelted, running as fast as they could, but Gamaliel couldn't keep up with Finnan. They're gaining on us, Finnan exclaimed. We'll have to wurgle into something faster. Gamaliel's legs were aching. No, he cried back. I can't. I've never even changed into a mouse. You go on, Finnan. I should never have come. Leave me here. Go. Tell the others. No one's going to be left anywhere. Finnan replied. All I have to do is wurgle into a bird strong enough to carry you and we'll both be safe. The ogres were almost upon them. Finnan leapt into the air, spreading his arms and flapping them. With a lurch, he fell. There were no feathers, no wings. The wurgling had not taken place. Shocked and fearful, he bolted upright and tried again and again. Nothing happened. He turned to Gamaliel and in a scared voice declared, I can't do it. Without the wood from the silent grove, I can't wurgle into anything. Oh, what are we to do? Gamaliel wept. The thorn ogres were crashing through the trees behind them. Finnan looked around wildly. The hill topped by a single chestnut tree was not far away and he gripped Gamaliel by the shoulders. Listen to me. It's up to you now. I can't wurgle, so you must. You have to. You're our only hope. But what about you? Finnan pointed to the hill. If I can reach that, I might be able to hide. But it doesn't matter. Only you do. Go, warn the others. Tell them what Gibble's done. Don't stop to worry about me. There isn't time. Tears pricked Gamaliel's eyes. And with the clamour of the enemy roaring behind him, Gamaliel Tumpin opened his wurgle pouch. Uncertainly, he reached into the velvety bag and he drew out a matted clump of fur, bristles and feathers. It's all mixed up, he howled. I don't even know which is the mouse. Just do it, Finnan told him. Gamaliel closed his eyes thrust the untidy mess under his nose and took one great despairing sniff. Stars exploded in the whirling's mind. His skin crackled and fizzed and his body was racked by vicious spasms as mighty forces gripped him. He was wurgling. But not all the venom of Frighty Aggie's sting had been drawn from his shoulder and they conferred strange powers upon young Gamaliel Tumpin. The bones of his legs creaked and stretched, buckling into those of a young hare. A sleek coat of ginger fur sprouted all over his face, and his hands became squirrel paws. From the top of his snookel hood burst a crown of feathers, and his jerkin ripped and tore when hedgehog spines came thrusting from his back. With a final jolt, a mouse's tail snaked out behind, and Gamaliel blinked in surprise. Finnan gawped at him. You're a bit of everything. It's incredible. Nobody can do that. Are you all right? Gamaliel nodded hastily and hopped upon his new legs. I think I can make it, he cried. I feel strong and swift. Then run, Finnan called for at that moment the ogres came rushing to snatch them. Off Gamaliel shot, bounding and leaping over the dead bracken, travelling faster than he ever had dreamt. Into his ears the wind went coursing, and the feathers on the top of his head waved madly as he raced along. Finnan couldn't begin to match the speed of his friend's new mongrel shape, and he fell rapidly behind. 
But the ogres were still clutching at his heels, and when he reached the lower slopes of the nettle-covered hill, he darted aside and shot up into the weeds. Like an avalanche of briar and bramble, the monsters rumbled by, yammering at the top of their rasping voices, calling for death and murder. Not daring to pause, Finnan scaled the hill, and when he reached the summit, clambered quickly up into the chestnut tree. Breathless and spent, he perched upon one of the lower branches and stared down at the forest roof. Through the twining boughs he saw the surging horde flood through Hagwood, heading unerringly for the land of the Whirlings. Above them the barn owl circled, and Finnan hoped that Gamaliel's new shape would not fail him. Good luck, he murmured. At the base of the tree, a small figure came crashing through the nettles and cackled to itself when it saw Finnan hiding in the branches. Snag it, want, it crooned, and licking its fangs, the imp began to climb. The weird, jumbled creature that was Gamaliel raced through the forest like the wind. But swooping from the sky, the owl dived and the secret passwords bawled from its beak. Gamaliel heard the rush of wings and waited for the protecting hedgehog spines to vanish. But to his delight, he remained unchanged. The ancient unlocking charm had been devised for only known forms, and over the hybrid creature he had wurgled into, they had no power. Above him, the owl squawked in impotent fury, and Gamaliel sprang away, his leveret's feet barely touching the ground. Across the hagburn, he vaulted. Where? Where? he hollered. Wolves! Owls! Witches! Where? Where? Into the land of the whirlings he raced, and the old alarm cry brought dozens of faces crowding to the entrances of their homes. What is it? they called gazing at the peculiar creature hurrying below and observing with dread the barn owl that was dive-bombing and hounding it. Who's down there? It's me, the uncanny beast yelled. Gamaliel Tumpin! He sped to the oak where his family lived and his father was already scuttling down to meet him. A stout stick was in Figgle Tumpin's fist and when the owl lunged for his son he leapt up and smote it across the leg. Get gone, you foul, flappy thing, he shouted, or I'll have your feathers in a pillow and you in a roast. The bird shrieked at him and raked with its claws. A fierce scratch cut across Figgle's cheek and he battered his stick in the owl's face. The messenger of Rhiannon screeched. But now many other whirlings were running to the Tumpin's aid, and with a mighty thrust of its wings the owl shot into the sky, accompanied by sticks, pebbles and rude shouts, then moved off over the trees towards the forest. Ah, that's got rid of it, the small folk cheered. Yuri Matuk came pushing through the throng. Well, what in Hagwood are you supposed to be? He demanded sternly. You're a disgrace, lad, an abominable nation. Don't you speak to our Gamaliel like that? Figgle cried, shoving Mr Matuk in the chest. And don't you push me! Yuri told him. Stop it! Gamaliel yelled. There are enemies coming. Huge monsters. You have to arm yourselves. Find whatever weapons you can, or they'll kill you all. Monsters? Yuri Matuk said. Yes! They caught Master Gibble, and he told them the passwords. Poor Finnan stuck back in the forest. He could be dead now, for all I know, or you care. Listen! The rumour of a tremendous uproar was rising from beyond the hagburn. Flocks of birds, frightened from the nest, took to the air, swirling through the sky as dense clouds. The whirlings murmured in dismay. Eurymatic stared at Gamaliel and realised the boy was speaking the truth. Make certain everyone has heard the alarm, he announced, turning to the frightened whirlings. Do as the lad says. Arm yourselves. We will meet this foe at our borders. Within minutes, a great number of the shape-changers were striding towards the stream bearing sticks and knives. Most of them had wurgled into fierce animal forms, rats, weasels, ferrets and stoats, but none of them suspected what manner of horror they were about to encounter. Still wearing his mongrel shape, 
Gamaliel watched the hasty preparations with Canella. Figgle and Tidubel had joined the ranks of the defenders, and the children felt woefully small and helpless as the tension swelled and the unholy tumult set the oaks to shivering. Then, from the forest, the thorn ogres came savaging. Over the hagburn they leapt, and the battle began. Wurgled's claws drove into woody flesh, and sharp teeth sank deep into the invaders' horrendous faces. Yet against the army of Rhiannon such assaults were vain and futile. Stoats and ferrets were dragged from the nightmare's heads by the ogre's more vicious claws. They were flung to the ground where clubbed feet smashed and crushed them. More perished when the ogres began to chant the secret passwords. When the last phrase was uttered, the brief conflict was ended. Robbed of their fierce guises, the whirlings howled in distress. From the branching bodies of the thorn ogres they slid, falling in terror before the cackling fiends who snatched and seized them, throttling and rending with wanton malice. Flee! Eurymatic cried. To the trees! To the trees! Away from the hagburn, the shape changes ran. Those who failed to make it to the lofty shelters were cruelly dealt with. Murdered victims were impaled on spiky branches, and the macabre trophies drew grief-stricken screams from their fleeing families. Into the nearest trees, the whirling scrambled. Pursued by Chokerstick, Figgle and Tidubel barely managed to gain their oak in time. Incensed, Chokerstick bellowed and lowering its repugnant head, butted the bowl of the tumpin oak. A ruinous shudder travelled up the towering tree, and Figgle yowled as his toes lost their grip on the bark. Don't you dare, my love! Tudubel scolded, reaching across to save and support him. But not all were so fortunate. Other whirlings fell, shrieking to their deaths, while those who had not reached the safety of the trees were slaughtered upon the ground. Petrified and sobbing, Tollichuk was too far from any hope of reaching sanctuary. He was stumbling through the fallen leaves when a huge shadow swamped him. Down came an immense, slavering head, and the narrow eyes lit upon Tollichuk's round figure greedily. No! The whirling boy blubbered. Go away, please, no! Two branching arms swung around to trap him, and Tollichuk bleated piteously. Blood kill, the unclean voice gloated. Whimpering, Tollichuk felt the stinking breath beat upon his face. A ferocious barking suddenly sounded, and from nowhere Lafidia's fox cub came rushing up to clamp its jaws about the thorn ogre's arm. The monster snarled and lumbered backwards, rearing on its stunted legs to shake the animal off. With a yelp, the cub was tossed aside and ran off through the woodland. But the distraction had been enough. Lafidia had darted in to rescue Tollichuk from the monster's clutches, and they were already scaling the nearest tree. But the threat was far from over. All through the woodland the ogres were clambering up, and there was nowhere for the whirlings to run. We're done for, Figgle breathed. Beyond the Hagburn, Finn and Lufkin was facing a peril of his own. In the branches of the chestnut tree, Snaggart was hunting him, gurgling with wicked relish. Sweet, <laughs> fangsome, dainty, it muttered. Snaggart want, Snaggart bite. To the top of the chestnut tree, the whirling hastened until at last there was nowhere left to run. He was trapped in the uppermost branches where only a pair of wings could save him. Snaggart drew the blade from its jaws and prowled nearer. Snappy, snappy, the thorn ogre hissed. Snaggart, chew, snaggart, crunch. It inched its way towards the despairing boy, savouring the terror written across its victim's face. Finnard had backed away as far as he could without falling from that hideous height, but it would be better to end his life that way. A quick plunge to death was preferable than being devoured by that loathsome devil. No, Snaggart snapped, guessing the thoughts of its prey. Blood kill! With that, the ogre pounced, and Finnan shrieked. But Snaggart squealed even louder, for as it leapt at the whirling, a gigantic claw reached up from beneath, and the imp was yanked backwards. 
Kicking and screaming, the smith's knife flying from its grasp, Snaggett was dragged down through the branches to a pair of waiting, clicking jaws. There was Frighty Aggie. Her monstrous, jointed legs were wrapped about the trunk and her many eyes were fixed upon Finnan. Stupefied, the whirling stared at her while, emitting one last squeal, Snaggett was bitten in half and eaten. The horror that dwelt behind the holly fence twisted its enormous head and the thin laugh that Finnan remembered all too clearly blistered across the forest. A pale gleam flickered in the depths of her countless eyes and suddenly... Finnan understood. In those fragmented clusters he saw a thousand distorted reflections of himself and realised just how close he had come to a doom like hers. To chew the wood of the silent grove was a perilous gamble. He could easily have suffered the same fate as she. Twice now she had spared his life, for in the unlit regions of her insect mind she recognised that there was a bond between them. You heard me cry out, Finnan said, and he no longer feared her. Just now you heard my voice and knew I was in danger. You came to help me because we're... We were the same. I'm like you. Like what you were before. I made the same terrible mistake. The abhorrent nightmare regarded him almost tenderly, as a mother might a son. But the only sound was the click of her awful jaws. Thank you, the boy murmured. A faint rattling noise echoed in her throat. Then down the tree her eight legs carried her, and in the chestnut's topmost branches he made a solemn promise to himself. Never again would he set foot in the whirling burial ground. From every tree a crimson rain was falling, and spiralling around the oaks, listening to the shrill screams of the dying were-rats, the messenger of the High Lady started to panic. The thorn ogres were out of control, and there was nothing it could do to halt the senseless, wasteful slaughter. Desist! the owl squawked. The one to whom the thieves spoke with must be found. Ye will slay them all. Halt, I say, this is not what she planned. But the monarch of the Hollow Hill had furnished her pets with meagre minds, and they were inflamed with a craving for death and blood that no one could restrain. Trapped against the elm's trunk, the Doolan family, Lafidia and Tollichuk, all stared up into Crackwhip's dribbling jaws, unable to lift their eyes to the bodies still hanging from its spiky crown. Boofus's thoughts flew to his dead brother. Was Mufus this afraid? In the Tumpin Oak, a gust of fetid breath blew upon the backs of Canella's legs, and she turned to see the ogre, Ungartaka's enormous pug face leering at her. Look out! she cried to the others as a twitching claw came stretching for them. Confronted by this new threat, they scattered in every direction. Some clambered up the trunk, while others ran along the branches. The groping claw separated Canella from the rest of her family, and driven back by the clutching talons, she was forced to disappear inside the entrance of the Tumpin home. No! her mother called. Not in there! The hooked claws of Ungataka pushed into the passage, and Gamaliel and his parents could only watch in horror and wait for her screams. Agonised wails ripped through the oak, but it was not Canella's voice. It was the thorn ogre. Shrieking in torment, Ungataka snatched its arm from the entrance. Its claw was smoking with flame. You come back here! Canella Tumpin cried, bustling out of the passage with a lantern in one hand and a fiery torch in the other. The thorn ogre screeched, and the fires leapt the length of its arm. Over the gigantic head the flames went scorching, and in a moment the creature's entire bulk was burning. The talons, holding the malignant creature to the oak, withered in the heat, and it plunged to the ground. Scampering over a branch to get a better view, Canella watched the ogre hit the woodland floor. It exploded in a violent burst of flame that singed her eyebrows when the searing vapour came blasting upwards. You knock next time, she bawled. From that moment on, the whirling's fortunes turned. 
Seeing what Canella had done, lamps and lanterns were immediately brandished in every treetop, and out of the branches the ogres dropped, shriveling and burning. Demented with the terror of the flames, the thorn ogres bolted blindly, raving and shrieking. From the witch elm of the Doolans, Crackwhip leapt, wreathed in a halo of fire. So ferociously did it rage that by the time it struck the ground, the creature was dead and its charred carcass crumbled to ashes and cinders. Columns of twisting black smoke wound about the trees as the yammering host took flight. To the stream they charged, and the whirlings came rushing after them, shouting and waving their torches. Yuri Matuk was one of them, carrying a long staff bound about with rags that were blazing brightly. Demon filth! he cried when his erstwhile attacker burst into flame. Gabbling in fulminating agony, it ran to the banks of the stream where it toppled from the edge, but exploded before hitting the water. That's an end of it, and the rest of them, Mr. Mattock declared, throwing the flaming brand to the ground. All those whirlings who were not injured or tending to the wounded gathered by the banks of the stream and gazed back at the smoking corpses of the enemy. Every one of them was stunned and shocked. They didn't know what those horrors had been or where they had come from. For the moment, the fact that they had been defeated was enough. From their oak, the Tumpin family joined the crowding survivors. Trading behind them, Gamaliel looked down at his paws. Now that the immediate danger was over, he knew he should return to his normal shape. But would he be able to? Frati Aggie had never managed to escape from her mongrel form. What if he was trapped like this forever? Dawdling behind the others, he closed his eyes and murmured the rhyme that Tursa Gibble had taught to them. I call on ye who lay beneath soil and sky, bark and leaf, unyoke flesh, unbar door, cast off shape and wear no more. Give again the form that's good by the might of great Hagwood. Nothing happened. The tail still swished behind him. The feathers streamed and bobbed from the top of his snookle hood, and he felt the weight of the hedgehog prickles sticking from his back. I'm stuck, he breathed miserably, jammed in this horrible shape for the rest of my life. What am I going to do? Canella turned to see where her brother had got to, and a scowl clouded her singed face. Gamaliel Tumpin, she bawled. Stop idling and get here now. At the mention of his name, Gamaliel was immediately seized by quivering forces that sent sharp, needling pains from the tip of his tail up to the topmost feather on his head. High into the air he leapt, juddering as each of the hedgehog spines went shooting back into his skin and his long legs returned to normal. When he landed back on the ground, he was back to his former self. Dizzily, Gamaliel looked over to where Canella was waiting, with her arms folded, and he grinned at her. Good job. She's so bossy, after all, he chuckled. Diving through the choking smoke, its creamy feathers darkened by smuts, the barn owl eyed the destruction of its mistress's forces with anger and contempt. The whir rats had proven more resilient than its mistress had anticipated. Those lowly creatures, which had escaped her notice these many years, would have to be considered anew. The one called Finnan Lufkin must be found, and the casket containing the beating heart of the High Lady recovered. <laughs> That night, in the silent grove, the bodies of those slain in the carnage were given to the beaches. Forty-nine whirlings had lost their lives that day, and as the sumptuous light of the last beech blossom dwindled and went out, Finn and Lufkin hung his head. His banishment had been lifted by Yuri Matuk, but his crime had not been forgiven. He was forbidden to enter the silent grove, and for that he was grateful. 
sitting beyond the brink of that hallowed dingle, in exactly the same spot where he had sat with the wandering smith only the night before, he watched as the mourning families began to depart. Lafidia's fox cub lay at his side, waiting impatiently for its beloved mistress to return, and Finnan stroked it gently. In the morning the council would meet, and this time they would listen to him. Their lives would never be the same again. Henceforth, the whirlings would have to arm themselves properly and learn how to fight. Wurgling was no longer any protection. The fox cub jolted and sat upright. Lafidia was leaving the grove with her mother, and the animal dashed across to greet her. Finnan smiled faintly, then raised his hand and got to his feet, for a plump figure was striding purposefully towards him. Wiping his eyes, Gamaliel Tumpin shook his head. So many, he uttered. And they were only the ones that could be found. They're saying that the real number of dead is more like sixty. It's only the beginning, Finnan said darkly. The High Lady won't stop now. She has other evils to send against us. We're at war, Gamaliel. She thinks we know where that casket is hidden. I wish the smith had told us. I'd open that gold box and stick a knife in her heart. From his belt, he took a silver-handled dagger that to him was more like a fat sword. Thimble glaive, Gamaliel cried in astonishment. I found it where it fell after the imp dropped it. Perhaps one day I'll be able to use it in a way that would make the smith proud. Gamaliel glanced nervously around him. When he was sure no one was watching, he whispered, Maybe you will, because I found something as well. Opening the neck of his wurgle pouch, Gamaliel reached inside. He must have put it here when he tended to my shoulder, he murmured. I discovered it this evening, but haven't dared show or tell anyone yet. Oh, Finnan, what are we supposed to do? Slowly, he withdrew his hand from the velvety bag and unfurled his fingers. Finnan caught his breath, and his grip upon Thimbleglave tightened as he saw. It was a thing that the wandering smith had carried with him throughout the long years of his self-imposed exile, a precious, most valuable object. In the deep desperation of his last night upon this earth, with the enemy closing around him, the Pooka had entrusted it and all his hope to the small, insignificant race of whirlings, so that they might continue should he fail. For there, lying upon Gamaliel Tumpin's open palm, was a delicate and beautiful golden key.
This audiobook was produced and published by Penguin Books Limited.